Ghost. The vision of three ladders. When Robert Samuel was brought forth to be burned, certain there were that heard him declare what strange things had happened unto him during the time of his imprisonment, to wit, that after he had famished or pined with hunger two or three days together, he then fell into a sleep, as it were one half in a slumber, at which time one clad all in white seemed to stand before him, who ministered comfort unto him by these words. Samuel, Samuel, be of good cheer, and take a good heart unto thee, for after this day shalt thou never be either hungry or thirsty. No less memorable it is, and worthy to be noted, concerning the three ladders which he told to divers he saw in his sleep, set up toward heaven, of the which there was one somewhat longer than the rest, but yet at length they became one, joining, as it were, all three together. As this godly martyr was going to the fire, there came a certain maid to him, which took him about the neck, and kissed him, who, being marked by them that were present, was sought for the next day after, to be had to prison and burned, as the very party herself informed me, howbeit, as God of his goodness would have it, she escaped their fiery hands, keeping herself secret in the town a good while after. But as this maid, called Rose Nottingham, was marvelously preserved by the providence of God, so there were other two honest women who did fall into the rage and fury of that time. The one was a brewer's wife, the other was a shoemaker's wife, but both together now espoused to a new husband, Christ. With these two was this maid aforesaid very familiar and well acquainted, who, on a time giving counsel to the one of them, that she should convey herself away while she had time and space, had this answer at her hand again, I know well, saith she, that it is lawful enough to fly away, which remedy you may use, if you list. But my case standeth otherwise. I am tied to a husband, and have besides young children at home, therefore I am minded, for the love of Christ and his truth, to stand to the extremity of the matter. And so the next day after Samuel suffered, these two godly wives, the one called in Potton, the other called Joan Trunchfield, the wife of Michael Trunchfield, shoemaker, of Ipswich, were apprehended, and had both into one prison together. As they were both by sex and nature somewhat tender, so were they at first less able to endure the straightness of the prison, and especially the brewer's wife was cast into marvelous great agonies and troubles of mind thereby. But Christ, beholding the weak infirmity of his servant, did not fail to help her when she was in this necessity, so at the length they both suffered after Samuel, in 1556, February 19th. And these, no doubt but, were those two ladders, which, being joined with the third, Samuel saw stretched up into heaven. This blessed Samuel, the servant of Christ, suffered the 31st of August, 1555. The report goeth among some that were there present, and saw him burn, that his body in burning did shine in the eyes of them that stood by, as bright and white as new tried silver. When Agnes Bonger saw herself separated from her prison fellows, what piteous moan that good woman made, how bitterly she wept, what strange thoughts came into her mind, how naked and desolate she esteemed herself, and into what plunge of despair and care her poor soul was brought, it was piteous and wonderful to see, which all came because she went not with them to give her life in the defense of her Christ, for of all things in the world, life was. Least looked for at her hands. For that morning in which she was kept back from burning, had she put on a smock, that she had prepared only for that purpose. And also having a child, a little young infant sucking on her, whom she kept with her tenderly all the time that she was in prison, against that day likewise did she send away to another nurse, and prepared herself presently to give herself for the testimony of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So little did she look for life, and so greatly did God's gifts work in her above nature, that death seemed a great deal better welcome than life. After which, she began a little to stay herself, and gave her whole exercise to reading and prayer, wherein she found no little comfort. In a short time came a writ from London for the burning, which according to the effect thereof, was executed. Hugh Laverick and John A. Price. Here we perceive that neither the impotence of age nor the affliction of blindness could turn aside the murdering fangs of these Babylonish monsters. The first of these unfortunates was of the parish of Barking, aged 68, a painter and a cripple. The other was blind, dark indeed in his visual faculties, but intellectually illuminated with the radiance of the everlasting gospel of truth. Inoffensive objects like these were informed against by some of the sons of bigotry and dragged before the prelatical shark of London, where they underwent examination, and replied to the articles propounded to them, as other Christian martyrs had done before. On the ninth day of May, in the consistory of St. Paul's, they were entreated to recant, and upon refusal, were sent to Fulham, where Bonner, by way of a dessert after dinner, condemned them to the agonies of the fire.
Being consigned to the secular officers, May 15, 1556, they were taken in a cart from Newgate to Stratford Lubau, where they were fastened to the stake. When Hugh Laverick was secured by the chain, having no further occasion for his crutch, he threw it away saying to his fellow martyr, while consoling him, Be of good cheer my brother, for my lord of London is our good physician, he will heal us both shortly thee of thy blindness, and me of my lameness. They sank down in the fire, to rise to immortality. The day after the above martyrdoms, Catherine Hutt, a Bocking, widow, Joan Horns, spinster, of Bilricka, Elizabeth Thackwell, spinster, of Great Burstead, suffered death in Smithfield. Thomas Dowry we have again to record an act of unpitying cruelty, exercised on this lad, whom Bishop Hooper had confirmed in the Lord and the knowledge of his word. How long this poor sufferer remained in prison is uncertain. By the testimony of one John Paylor, Register of Gloucester, we learn that when Dowry was brought before Dr. Williams, then Chancellor of Gloucester, the usual articles were presented him for subscription. From these he dissented, and, upon the doctor's demanding of whom and where he had learned his heresies, the youth replied, Indeed, Mr. Chancellor, I learned from you in that very pulpit. On such a day, naming the day, you said, in preaching upon the sacrament, that it was to be exercised spiritually by faith, and not carnally and really, as taught by the papists. Dr. Williams then bid him recant, as he had done, but Dowry had not so learned his duty. Though you, said he, can so easily mock God, the world, and your own conscience, yet will I not do so. Preservation of George Crow and his Testament This poor man, of Malden, May 26, 1556, put to sea, to late in Lent with Fuller's earth, but the boat, being driven on land, filled with water, and everything was washed out of her, Crow, however, saved his testament, and coveted nothing else. With Crow was a man and a boy, whose awful situation became every minute more alarming, as the boat was useless, and they were ten miles from land, expecting the tide should in a few hours set in upon them. After prayer to God, they got upon the mast, and hung there for the space of ten hours, when the poor boy, overcome by cold and exhaustion, fell off, and was drowned. The tide having abetted, Crow proposed to take down the masts, and float upon them, which they did, and at ten o'clock at night they were borne away at the mercy of the waves. On Wednesday, in the night, Crow's companion died through the fatigue and hunger, and he was left alone, calling upon God for succor. At length he was picked up by a Captain Morse, bound to Antwerp, who had nearly steered away, taking him for some fisherman's buoy floating in the sea. As soon as Crow was got on board, he put his hand in his bosom, and drew out his testament, which indeed was wet, but not otherwise injured. At Antwerp he was well received, and the money he had lost was more than made good to him. Executions at Stratford Lubau At this sacrifice, which we are about to detail no less than thirteen were doomed to the fire. Each one refusing to subscribe contrary to conscience, they were condemned, and the 27th of June, 1556, was appointed for their execution at Stratford Lubau. Their constancy in faith glorified their Redeemer, equally in life and in death. Reverend Julius Palmer this gentleman's life presents a singular instance of error and conversion. In the time of Edward, he was a rigid and obstinate papist, so adverse to godly and sincere preaching, that he was even despised by his own party, that this frame of mind should be changed, and he suffer persecution and death in Queen Mary's reign, are among those events of omnipotence at which we wonder and admire. Mr. Palmer was born at Coventry, where his father had been mayor. Being afterward removed to Oxford, he became, under Mr. Harley, of Magdalen College, an elegant Latin and Greek scholar. He was fond of useful disputation, possessed of a lively wit and a strong memory. Indefatigable in private study, he rose at four in the morning, and by this practice qualified himself to become reader in logic in Magdalen College. The times of Edward, however, favoring the Reformation, Mr. Palmer became frequently punished for his contempt of prayer and orderly behavior, and was at length expelled the house. He afterwards embraced the doctrines of the Reformation, which occasioned his arrest and final condemnation. A certain nobleman offered him his life if he would recant. If so, said he, thou wilt dwell with me. And if thou wilt set thy mind to marriage, I will procure thee a wife and a farm and help to stuff and fit thy farm for thee. How sayst thou? Palmer thanked him very courteously, but very modestly and reverently concluded that as he had already in two places renounced his living for Christ's sake, 
so he would with God's grace be ready to surrender and yield up his life also for the same, when God should send time. When Sir Richard perceived that he would by no means relent. Well, Palmer, saith he, then I perceive one of us twain shall be damned, for we be of two faiths, and certain I am there is, but one faith that leadeth to life and salvation. Palmer, O oh sir, I hope that we both shall be saved. Sir Richard, how may that be? Palmer, right well, sir. For as it hath pleased our merciful Saviour, according to the Gospel's parable, to call me at the third hour of the day, even in my flowers, at the age of four and twenty years, even so I trust he hath called, and will call you, at the eleventh hour of this your old age, and give you everlasting life for your portion. Sir Richard, sayest thou so? Well, Palmer, well, I would I might have thee but one month in my house, I doubt not, but I would convert thee, or thou shouldst convert me. Then said Master Winchcombe, Take pity on thy golden years, and pleasant flowers of lusty youth, before it be too late. Palmer, sir, I long for those springing flowers that shall never fade away. He was tried on the 15th of July, 1556, together with one Thomas Askin, fellow prisoner. Askin and one John Gwynne had been sentenced the day before, and Mr. Palmer, on the 15th, was brought up for final judgment. Execution was ordered to follow the sentence, and at five o'clock in the same afternoon, at a place called the Sand Pits, these three martyrs were fastened to a stake. After devoutly praying together, they sung the thirty-first psalm. When the fire was kindled, and it had seized their bodies, without an appearance of enduring pain, they continued to cry, Lord Jesus, strengthen us. Lord Jesus receive our souls, until animation was suspended and human suffering was past. It is remarkable, that, when their heads had fallen together in a mass as it were by the force of the flames, and the spectators thought Palmer is lifeless, his tongue and lips again moved, and were heard to pronounce the name of Jesus, to whom be glory and honor forever. Joan Waste and Others This poor, honest woman, blind from her birth, and unmarried, aged twenty-two, was of the parish of All Hallows, Derby. Her father was a barber, and also made ropes for a living, in which she assisted him, and also learned to knit several articles of apparel. Refusing to communicate with those who maintained doctrines contrary to those she had learned in the days of the pious Edward, she was called before Dr. Dracut, the Chancellor of Bishop Blaine, and Peter Finch, official of Derby. With sophistical arguments and threats they endeavored to confound the poor girl, but she proffered to yield to the bishop's doctrine if he would answer for her at the day of judgment, as pious Dr. Taylor had done in his sermons, that his belief of the real presence of the sacrament was true. The bishop at first answered that he would, but Dr. Dracut reminding him that he might not in any way answer for a heretic, he withdrew his confirmation of his own tenets, and she replied that if their consciences would not permit them to answer at God's bar for that truth they wished her to subscribe to, she would answer no more questions. Sentence was then adjudged, and Dr. Dracut appointed to preach her condemned sermon, which took place August 1, 1556, the day of her martyrdom. His fulminating discourse being finished, the poor, sightless object was taken to a place called Windmill Pit, near the town, where she for a time held her brother by the hand, and then prepared herself for the fire, calling upon the pitying multitude to pray with her, and upon Christ to have mercy upon her, until the glorious light of the everlasting Son of Righteousness beamed upon her departed spirit. In November, fifteen martyrs were imprisoned in Canterbury Castle, of whom all were either burnt or famished. Among the latter were J. Clark, D. Chittenden, W. Foster of Stonk, Alice Potkins, and J. Archer of Cranbrook, Weaver. The two first of these had not received condemnation, but the others were sentenced to the fire. Foster, at his examination, observed upon the utility of carrying lighted candles about on Candlemas Day, that he might as well carry a pitchfork, and that a gibbet would have as good an effect as the cross. We have now brought to a close the sanguinary prescriptions of the merciless Mary, in the year 1556, the number of which amounted to above 84. The beginning of the year 1557 was remarkable for the visit of Cardinal Pole to the University of Cambridge, which seemed to stand in need of much cleansing from heretical preachers and reformed doctrines. One object was also to play the popish farce of trying Martin Bucer and Paulus Fagius, who had been buried about three or four years, for which purpose the churches of St. Mary and St. Michael, where they lay, were interdicted as vile and unholy places, unfit to worship God in, until they were perfumed and washed with the Pope's holy water, etc., etc., and we interdict all persons whatsoever of this university, town, or places adjacent, who shall.
read or conceal their heretical book, as well by the common law, as by our letters of process. And we interdict all persons whatsoever of this university, town, or places adjacent, who shall read or conceal their heretical book, as well by the common law, as by our letters of process. After the sentence thus read, the bishop commanded their bodies to be dug out of their graves, and being degraded from holy orders, delivered them into the hands of the secular power, for it was not lawful for such innocent persons as they were, abhorring all bloodshed, and detesting all desire of murder, to put any man to death. February 6, the bodies, enclosed as they were in chests, were carried into the midst of the marketplace at Cambridge, accompanied by a vast concourse of people. A great post was set fast in the ground, to which the chests were affixed with a large iron chain, and bound round their centers, in the same manner as if the dead bodies had been alive. When the fire began to ascend, and caught the coffins, a number of condemned books were also launched into the flames, and burnt. Justice, however, was done to the memories of these pious and learned men in Queen Elizabeth's reign, when Mr. Ackworth, orator of the university, and Mr. J. A. Pilkington, pronounced orations in honor of their memory, and in reprobation of their Catholic persecutors. Cardinal Pole also inflicted his harmless rage upon the dead body of Peter Martyr's wife, who, by his command, was dug out of her grave and buried on a distant dunghill, partly because her bones lay near St. Friedwide's relics, held once in great esteem in that college, and partly because he wished to purify Oxford of heretical remains as well as Cambridge. In the succeeding reign, however, her remains were restored to their former cemetery, and even intermingled with those of the Catholic saint, to the utter astonishment and mortification of the disciples of His Holiness the Pope. Cardinal Pole published a list of 54 articles, containing instructions to the clergy of his Diocese of Canterbury, some of which are too ludicrous and puerile to excite any other sentiment than laughter in these days. Persecutions in the Diocese of Canterbury in the month of February, the following persons were committed to prison, are Colin, of Walden, Labourer, Joan Winsley, of Horsley Magna, Spinster, S. Glover, of Rayleigh, our Clerk, of Much Holland, Mariner, W. Munt, of Much Bentley, Sawyer, Margafield, of Ramsey, Spinster, our Bonger, Courier, our Jolly, Mariner. Alan Simpson, Helen Uire, C. Pepper, Widow, Alice Wally, who recanted, W. Bonger, Glazier, all of Colchester, R. Atkin, of Halstead, Weaver, R. Barcock, of Wilton, Carpenter, R. E. George, of Westbarholt, Laborer, R. Debnam of Debenham, Weaver, C. Warren, of Coxall, Spinster, Agnes Whitlock, of Dover Court, Spinster. Rose Allen, Spinster, and T. Ferrisands, Minor, both of Colchester. These persons were brought before Bonner, who would have immediately sent them to execution, but Cardinal Pole was for more merciful measures, and Bonner, in a letter of his to the Cardinal, seems to be sensible that he had displeased him, for he has this expression, I thought to have them all hither to Fulham, and to have given sentence against them, nevertheless, perceiving by my last doing that your grace was offended, I thought it my duty, before I proceeded further, to inform your grace. This circumstance verifies the account that the Cardinal was a humane man, and though a zealous Catholic, we, as Protestants, are willing to render him that honor which his merciful character deserves. Some of the bitter persecutors denounced him to the Pope as a favorer of heretics, and he was summoned to Rome, but Queen Mary, by particular entreaty, procured his stay. However, before his latter end, and a little before his last journey from Rome to England, he was strongly suspected of favoring the doctrine of Luther. As in the last sacrifice for women did honor to the truth, so in the following auto de fe we have the like number of females and males, who suffered June 30, 1557, at Canterbury, and were J. Fishcock, F. White, in Pardue, Barbary Final, Widow, Bardbridge's Widow, Wilson's Wife, and Bendon's Wife. Of this group we shall more particularly notice Alice Bendon, wife of Edward Bender, of Staplust, Kent. She had been taken up in October, 1556, for non-attendance, and released upon a strong injunction to mind her conduct. Her husband was a bigoted Catholic, and publicly speaking of his wife's contumacy, she was conveyed to Canterbury Castle, where knowing, when she should be removed to the bishop's prison, she should be almost starved upon three farthings a day, she endeavored to prepare herself for this suffering by living upon tuppence halfpenny per day. On January 22, 1557, her husband wrote to the bishop that if his wife's brother, Roger Hall, were to be kept from consoling and relieving her, she might turn, on this account, she was moved to a prison called Monday's Hole. 
Her brother sought diligently for her, and at the end of five weeks providentially heard her voice in the dungeon, but could not otherwise relieve her than by putting so money in a loaf and sticking it on a long pole. Dreadful must have been the situation of this poor victim, lying on straw, between stone walls, without a change of apparel, or the meanest requisites of cleanliness, during a period of nine weeks. On March 25th she was summoned before the bishop, who, with rewards, offered her liberty if she would go home and be comfortable, but Mrs. Benden had been inured to suffering, and, showing him her contracted limbs and emaciated appearance, refused to swerve from the truth. She was however removed from this black hole to the west gate, whence, about the end of April, she was taken out to be condemned, and then committed to the castle prison until the 19th of June, the day of her burning. At the stake, she gave her handkerchief to one John Banks, as a memorial, and from her waist she drew a white lace, desiring him to give it to her brother, and tell him that it was the last band that had bound her, except the chain, and to her father she returned a shilling he had sent her. The whole of these seven martyrs undressed themselves with alacrity, and, being prepared, knelt down, and prayed with an earnestness and Christian spirit that even the enemies of the cross were affected. After invocation made together, they were secured to the stake, and, being encompassed with the unsparing flames, they yielded their souls into the hands of the living Lord. Matthew Plays, Weaver, a sincere and shrewd Christian, of Stone, Kent, was brought before Thomas, Bishop of Dover, and other inquisitors whom he ingeniously teased by his indirect answers, of which the following is a specimen. Dr. Harpsfield. Christ called the bread his body, what dost thou say it is? Plays. I do believe it was that which he gave them. Dr. H. What is that? P. That which he break. Dr. H. What did he break? P. That which he took. Dr. H. What did he take? P. I say, what he gave them, that did they eat indeed. Dr. H. Well, then, thou sayest it was but bread which the disciples did eat. P. I say, what he gave them, that did they eat indeed. A very long disputation followed, in which Plays was desired to humble himself to the bishop, but this he refused. Whether this zealous person died in prison, was executed, or delivered, history does not mention. Reverend John Hullier Reverend John Hullier was brought up at Eton College, and in process of time became curate of Babram, three miles from Cambridge, and went afterward to Lynn, where, opposing the superstition of the Papists, he was carried before Dr. Thilby, Bishop of Ely, and sent to Cambridge Castle, here he lay for a time, and was then sent to Tolbooth Prison, where, after three months, he was brought to St. Mary's Church, and condemned by Dr. Fuller. On Monday Thursday he was brought to the stake, while undressing, he told the people to bear witness that he was about to suffer in a just cause, and exhorted them to believe that there was no other rock than Jesus Christ to build upon. A priest named Boys then desired the mayor to silence him. After praying, he went meekly to the stake, and being bound with a chain, and placed in a pitch barrel, fire was applied to the reeds and wood, but the wind drove the fire directly to his back, which caused him under the severe agony to pray the more fervently. His friends directed the executioner to fire the pile to windward of his face, which was immediately done. A quantity of books were now thrown into the fire, one of which, the communion service, he caught, opened it, and joyfully continued to read it, until the fire and smoke deprived him of sight, then even, in earnest prayer, he pressed the book to his heart, thanking God for bestowing on him in his last moments this precious gift. The day being hot, the fire burned fiercely, and at a time when the spectators supposed he was no more, he suddenly exclaimed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and meekly resign his life. He was burnt on Jesus Green, not far from Jesus College. He had gunpowder given him, but he was dead before it became ignited. This pious sufferer afforded a singular spectacle, for his flesh was so burnt from the bones, which continued erect, that he presented the idea of a skeleton figure chained to the stake. His remains were eagerly seized by the multitude, and venerated by all who admired his piety or detested inhuman bigotry. Simon Miller and Elizabeth Cooper In the following month of July, received the crown of martyrdom. Miller dwelt at Lynn, and came to Norwich, where, planting himself at the door of one of the churches, as the people came out, he requested to know of them where he could go to receive the communion. For this a priest brought him before Dr. Dunning, who committed him to ward, but he was suffered to go home and arrange his affairs, 
after which he returned to the bishop's house and to his prison, where he remained until the 13th of July, the day of his burning. Elizabeth Cook, wife of a pewterer of S.A. Andrews, Norwich, had recanted, but tortured for what she had done by the worm which dieth not, she shortly after voluntarily entered her parish church during the time of the popish service, and standing up, audibly proclaimed that she revoked her former recantation, and cautioned the people to avoid her unworthy example. She was taken from her own house by Mr. Sutton the sheriff, who very reluctantly complied with the letter of the law, as they had been servants and in friendship together. At the stake, the poor sufferer, feeling the fire, uttered the cry of O, upon which Mr. Miller, putting his hand behind him towards her, desired her to be of a good courage, for, said he, good sister, we shall have a joyful and a sweet supper. Encouraged by this example and exhortation, she stood the fiery ordeal without flinching, and, with him, proved the power of faith over the flesh. Executions at Colchester It was before mentioned that twenty-two persons had been sent up from Colchester, who upon a slight submission, were afterward released. Of these, William Munt, of Much Bentley, husbandman, with Alice, his wife, and Rose Allen, her daughter, upon their return home, abstained from church, which induced the bigoted priest secretly to write to Bonner. For a short time they absconded, but returning again, March 7th, one Edmund Tyrell, a relation of the Tyrell who murdered King Edward V and his brother, with the officers, entered the house while Munt and his wife were in bed, and informed them that they must go to Colchester Castle. Mrs. Munt at that time being very ill, requested her daughter to get her some drink, leave being permitted, Rose took a candle and a mug, and in returning through the house was met by Tyrell, who cautioned her to advise her parents to become good Catholics. Rose briefly informed him that they had the Holy Ghost for their advisor, and that she was ready to lay down her own life for the same cause. Turning to his company, he remarked that she was willing to burn, and one of them told him to prove her, and see what she would do by and by. The unfeeling wretch immediately executed this project, and, seizing the young woman by the wrist, he held the lighted candle under her hand, burning it crosswise on the back, until the tendons divided from the flesh, during which he loaded her with many opprobrious epithets. She endured his rage unmoved, and then, when he had ceased the torture, she asked him to begin at her feet or head, for he need not fear that his employer would one day repay him. After this she took the drink to her mother. This cruel act of torture does not stand alone on record. Bonner had served a poor blind harper in nearly the same manner, who had steadily maintained a hope that if every joint of him were to be burnt, he should not fly from the faith. Bonner, upon this, privately made a signal to his men, to bring a burning coal, which they placed in the poor man's hand, and then by force held it closed, until it burnt into the flesh deeply. George Eagles, Taylor, was indicted for having prayed that God would turn Queen Mary's heart, or take her away, the ostensible cause of his death was his religion, for treason could hardly be imagined in praying for the reformation of such an execrable soul as that of Mary. Being condemned for this crime, he was drawn to the place of execution upon a sledge, with two robbers, who were executed with him. After Eagles had mounted the ladder, and been turned off a short time, he was cut down before he was at all insensible, a bailiff, named William Swallow, then dragged him to the sledge, and with a common blunt cleaver, hacked off the head, in a manner equally clumsy and cruel, he opened his body and tore out the heart. In all this suffering the poor martyr repined not, but to the last called upon his saviour. The fury of these bigots did not end here, the intestines were burnt, and the body was quartered, the four parts being sent to Colchester, Harwich, Chelmsford, and St. Rouse's. Chelmsford had the honor of retaining his head, which was affixed to a long pole in the marketplace. In time it was blown down, and lay several days in the street, until it was buried at night in the churchyard. God's judgment not long after fell upon Swallow, who in his old age became a beggar, and who was affected with a leprosy that made him obnoxious even to the animal creation, nor did Richard Potts, who troubled eagles in his dying moments, escape the visiting hand of God. Mrs. Joyce Lewis This lady was the wife of Mr. T. Lewis, of Manchester. She had received the Romish religion as true, until the burning of that pious martyr, Mr. Saunders, at Coventry. Understanding that his death arose from a refusal to receive the Mass, she began to inquire into the ground of his refusal, and her conscience, as it began to be enlightened, became restless and alarmed. In this inquietude, she resorted to Mr. John Glover, who lived near, and requested that he would unfold those rich sources of gospel knowledge he possessed, particularly upon the subject of transubstantiation. 
he easily succeeded in convincing her that the mummery of popery and the mass were at variance with God's most holy word, and honestly reproved her for following too much the vanities of a wicked world. It was to her indeed a word in season, for she soon became weary of her former sinful life and resolved to abandon the mass and dilatrous worship. Though compelled by her husband's violence to go to church, her contempt of the holy water and other ceremonies was so manifest that she was accused before the bishop for despising the sacramentals. A citation, addressed to her, immediately followed, which was given to Mr. Lewis, who, in a fit of passion, held a dagger to the throat of the officer, and made him eat it, after which he caused him to drink it down, and then sent him away. But for this the bishop summoned Mr. Lewis before him as well as his wife, the former readily submitted, but the latter resolutely affirmed, that, in refusing holy water, she neither offended God, nor any part of his laws. She was sent home for a month, her husband being bound for her appearance, during which time Mr. Glover impressed upon her the necessity of doing what she did, not from self-vanity, but for the honor and glory of God. Mr. Glover and others earnestly exhorted Lewis to forfeit the money he was bound in, rather than subject his wife to certain death, but he was deaf to the voice of humanity, and delivered her over to the bishop, who soon found sufficient cause to consign her to a loathsome prison, when she was several times brought for examination. At the last time, the bishop reasoned with her upon the fitness of her coming to Mass, and receiving as sacred the sacrament and sacramentals of the Holy Ghost. If these things were in the Word of God, said Mrs. Lewis, I would with all my heart receive, believe, and esteem them. The bishop, with the most ignorant and impious effrontery, replied, If thou wilt believe no more than what is warranted by scriptures, thou art in a state of damnation. Astonished at such a declaration, this worthy sufferer ably rejoined that his words were as impure as they were profane. After condemnation, she lay a twelvemonth in prison, the sheriff not being willing to put her to death in his time, though he had been but just chosen. When her death warrant came from London, she sent for some friends, whom she consulted in what manner her death might be more glorious to the name of God, and injurious to the cause of God's enemies. Smilingly, she said, as for death, I think but lightly of. When I know that I shall behold the amiable countenance of Christ my dear Saviour, the ugly face of death does not much trouble me. The evening before she suffered, two priests were anxious to visit her, but she refused both their confession and absolution, when she could hold a better communication with the high priest of souls. About three o'clock in the morning, Satan began to shoot his fiery darts, by putting into her mind to doubt whether she was chosen to eternal life, and Christ died for her. Her friends readily pointed out to her those consolatory passages of scripture which comfort the fainting heart, and treat of the Redeemer who taketh away the sins of the world. About eight o'clock the sheriff announced to her that she had but an hour to live, she was at first cast down, but this soon passed away, and she thanked God that her life was about to be devoted to his service. The sheriff granted permission for two friends to accompany her to the stake in indulgence for which he was afterward severely handled. Mr. Renigger and Mr. Bernher led her to the place of execution, in going to which, from its distance, her great weakness, and the press of the people, she had nearly fainted. Three times she prayed fervently that God would deliver the land from popery and the idolatrous mass, and the people for the most part, as well as the sheriff, said Amen. When she had prayed, she took the cup, which had been filled with water to refresh her, and said, I drink to all them that unfeignedly love the gospel of Christ, and wish for the abolition of popery. Her friends, and a great many women of the place, drank with her, for which most of them afterward were enjoined penance. When chained to the stake, her countenance was cheerful and the roses of her cheeks were not abetted. Her hands were extended towards heaven until the fire rendered them powerless, when her soul was received into oh, the arms of the Creator. The duration of her agony was but short, as the undersheriff, at the request of her friends, had prepared such excellent fuel that she was in a few minutes overwhelmed with smoke and flame. The case of this lady drew a tear of pity from everyone who had a heart not callous to humanity. Executions at Islington about the 17th of September, suffered at Islington the following four professors of Christ, Ralph Allerton, James Ostu, Marjorie Ostu, and Richard Roth. James Ostu and his wife, of St. Allhallows, Barking, London, were sentenced for not believing in the presence. Richard Roth rejected the seven sacraments, and was accused of comforting the heretics by the following letter written in his own blood, and intended to have been sent to his friends at Colchester. O oh dear brethren and sisters! How much reason have you to rejoice in God, 
that he hath given you such faith to overcome this bloodthirsty tyrant thus far. And no doubt he that hath begun that good work in you will fulfill it unto the end. O dear hearts in Christ, what a crown of glory shall you receive with Christ in the kingdom of God? O that it had been the good will of God that I had been ready to have gone with you, for I lie in my Lord's littlies by day, and in the night I lie in the coal house, apart from Ralph Allerton, or any other, and we look every day when we shall be condemned, for he said that I should be burned within ten days before Easter, but I lie still at the pool's brink, and every man goeth in before me, but we abide patiently the Lord's leisure, with many bonds, in fetters and stocks, by which we have received great joy of God. And now fare you well, dear brethren and sisters, in this world, but I trust to see you in the heavens face to face. O brother Munt, with your wife and my sister Rose, how blessed are you in the Lord, that God hath found you worthy to suffer for his sake. With all the rest of my dear brethren and sisters known and unknown. O be joyful even unto death. Fear it not, saith Christ, for I have overcome death. O dear heart, seeing that Jesus Christ will be our help, O tarry you the Lord's leisure. Be strong, let your hearts be of good comfort, and wait you still for the Lord. He is at hand. Yeah, the angel of the Lord pitcheth his tent round about them that fear him, and delivereth them which way he seeth best. For our lives are in the Lord's hands, and they can do nothing unto us before God suffer them. Therefore give all thanks to God. O dear hearts, you shall be clothed in long white garments upon the Mount of Shown, with the multitude of saints, and with Jesus Christ our Saviour, who will never forsake us. O blessed virgins, ye have played the wise virgin's part, in that ye have taken oil in your lamps that ye may go in with the bridegroom, when he cometh, into the everlasting joy with him. But as for the foolish, they shall be shut out, because they made not themselves ready to suffer with Christ, neither go about to take up his cross. O dear hearts, how precious shall your death be in the sight of the Lord! For dear is the death of his saints. O oh, fare you well, and pray. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen, Amen. Pray, pray, pray. Written by me, with my own blood. Richard Roth. This letter, so justly denominating Bonner the bloodthirsty tyrant, was not likely to excite his compassion. Roth accused him of bringing them to secret examination by night, because he was afraid of the people by day. Resisting every temptation to recant, he was condemned, and on September 17, 1557, these four martyrs perished at Islington, for the testimony of the Lamb, who was slain that they might be of the redeemed of God. John Noyes, a shoemaker, of Laxfield, Suffolk, was taken to I, and at midnight, September 21, 1557, he was brought from I to Laxfield to be burned. On the following morning he was led to the stake, prepared for the horrid sacrifice. Mr. Noyes, on coming to the fatal spot, knelt down, prayed, and rehearsed the 50th psalm. When the chain enveloped him, he said, Fear not them that kill the body, but fear him that can kill both body and soul, and cast it into everlasting fire. As one cadman placed a faggot against him, he blessed the hour in which he was born to die for the truth, and while trusting only upon the all-sufficient merits of the Redeemer, fire was set to the pile and the blazing faggots in a short time stifled his last words, Lord, have mercy on me. Christ, have mercy upon me. The ashes of the body were buried in a pit, and with them one of his feet, whole to the ankle, with the stocking on. Mrs. Cicely Orms This young martyr, aged twenty-two, was the wife of Mr. Edmund Orms, worsted weaver of St. Lawrence, Norwich. At the death of Miller and Elizabeth Cooper, before mentioned, she had said that she would pledge them of the same cup they drank of. For these words she was brought to the Chaneller, who would have discharged her upon promising to go to church, and to keep her belief to herself. As she would not consent to this, the Chancellor urged that he had shown more lenity to her than any other person, and was unwilling to condemn her, because she was an ignorant foolish woman, to this she replied, perhaps with more shrewdness than he expected, that however great his desire might be to spare her sinful flesh, it could not equal her inclination to surrender it up in so great a quarrel. The Chancellor then pronounced the fiery sentence, and September 23, 1557, she was brought to the stake, at eight o'clock in the morning. After declaring her faith to the people, she laid her hand on the stake, and said, Welcome, thou cross of Christ. Her hand was soot in doing this, for it was the same stake at which Miller and Cooper were burnt, and she at first wiped it, but directly after again welcomed and embraced it as the sweet cross of Christ. 
After the tormentors had kindled the fire, she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit doth rejoice in God my Saviour. Then crossing her hands upon her breast, and looking upwards with the utmost serenity, she stood the fiery furnace. Her hands continued gradually to rise until the sinews were dried, and then they fell. She uttered no sigh of pain, but yielded her life, an emblem of that celestial paradise in which is the presence of God, blessed forever. It might be contended that this martyr voluntarily sought her own death, as the Chancellor scarcely exacted any other penance of her than to keep her belief to herself, yet it should seem in this instance as if God had chosen her to be a shining light, for a twelvemonth before she was taken, she had recanted, but she was wretched until the Chancellor was informed, by letter, that she repented of her recantation from the bottom of her heart. As if to compensate for her former apostasy, and to convince the Catholics that she meant to more to compromise for her personal security, she boldly refused his friendly offer of permitting her to temporize. Her courage in such a cause deserves commendation the cause of him who has said, Whoever is ashamed of me on earth, of such will I be ashamed in heaven. Reverend John Ruff This pious martyr was a Scotchman. At the age of seventeen, he entered himself as one of the Order of Black Friars, at Stirling, in Scotland. He had been kept out of an inheritance by his friends, and he took this step in revenge for their conduct to him. After being there sixteen years, Lord Hamilton, Earl of Arran, taking a liking to him, the Archbishop of St. Andrews induced the provincial of the house to dispense with his habit and order, and he thus became the Earl's chaplain. He remained in this spiritual employment a year, and in that time God wrought in him a saving knowledge of the truth, for which reason the Earl sent him to preach in the freedom of air, where he remained four years, but finding danger there from the religious complexion of the times, and learning that there was much gospel freedom in England, he travelled up to the Duke of Somerset, then Lord Protector of England, who gave him a yearly salary of twenty pounds, and authorized him, to preach at Carlisle, Berwick, and Newcastle, where he married. He was afterward removed to a benefice at Hull, in which he remained until the death of Edward VI. In consequence of the tide of persecution then setting in, he fled with his wife to Friesland, and at Norden they followed the occupation of knitting hose, caps, etc., for subsistence. Impeded in his business by the want of yarn, he came over to England to procure a quantity, and on November 10th, arrived in London, where he soon heard of a secret society of the faithful, to whom he joined himself, and was in a short time elected their minister, in which occupation he strengthened them in every good resolution. On December 12th, through the information of one tailor, a member of the society, Mr. Ruff, with Cuthbert Simpson and others, was taken up in the Saracen's Head, Islington, where, under the pretext of coming to see a play, their religious exercises were holden. The Queen's Vice-Chamberlain conducted Ruff and Simpson before the Council, in whose presence they were charged with meeting to celebrate the Communion. The Council wrote to Bonner and he lost no time in this affair of blood. In three days he had him up, and on the next, the twentieth, resolved to condemn him. The charges laid against him were, that he, being a priest, was married, and that he had rejected the service in the Latin tongue. Ruff wanted not arguments to reply to these flimsy tenets. In short, he was degraded and condemned. Mr. Ruff, it should be noticed, when in the north, in Edward V.I.'s reign, had saved Dr. Watson's life, who afterwards sat with Bishop Bonner on the bench. This ungrateful prelate, in return for the kind act he had received, boldly accused Mr. Ruff of being the most pernicious heretic in the country. The godly minister reproved him for his malicious spirit, he affirmed that, during the thirty years he had lived, he had never bowed the knee to ball and that twice at Rome he had seen the Pope borne about on men's shoulders with the false name sacrament carried before him, presenting a true picture of the very Antichrist, yet was more reverence shown to him than to the wafer, which they accounted to be their God. Ah, said Bonner, rising, and making towards him, as if he would have torn his garment, hast thou been at Rome, and seen our holy father the Pope, and dost thou blaspheme him after this sort? This said, he fell upon him, tore off a piece of his beard, and that the day might begin to his own satisfaction, he ordered the object of his rage to be burnt by half-past five the following morning. Cuthbert Simpson Few professors of Christ possessed more activity and zeal than this excellent person. He not only labored to preserve his friends from the contagion of pulpery, but he labored to guard them against the terrors of persecution. He was deacon of the little congregation over which Mr. Ruff presided as minister. Mr. Simpson has written an account of his own sufferings, which he cannot detail better than in his own words. 
On the 13th of December, 1557, I was committed by the council to the Tower of London. On the following Thursday, I was called into the wardroom before the constable of the Tower and the recorder of London, Mr. Chomley, who commanded me to inform them of the names of those who came to the English service. I answered that I would declare nothing, in consequence of my refusal, I was set upon a rack of iron, as I judge for the space of three hours. They then asked me if I would confess, I answered as before. After being unbound, I was carried back to my lodging. The Sunday after I was brought to the same place again, before the lieutenant and recorder of London, and they examined me. As I had answered before, so I answered now. Then the lieutenant swore by God I should tell, after which my two forefingers were bound together, and a small arrow placed between them, they drew it through so fast that the blood followed, and the arrow brake. After enduring the rack twice again, I was retaken to my lodging, and ten days after the lieutenant asked me if I would not now confess that which they had before asked of me. I answered, that I had already said as much as I would. Three weeks after I was sent to the priest, where I was greatly assaulted, and at whose hand I received the Pope's curse, for bearing witness of the resurrection of Christ. And thus I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace, with all those who unfeignedly call upon the name of Jesus, desiring God of his endless mercy, through the merits of his dear Son Jesus Christ, to bring us all to his everlasting kingdom, Amen. I praise God for his great mercy shown upon us. Sing Hosanna to the highest with me, Cuthbert Simpson. God forgive my sins. I ask forgiveness of all the world, and I forgive all the world, and thus I leave the world, in the hope of a joyful resurrection. If this account be duly considered, what a picture of repeated tortures does it present? But even the cruelty of the narration is exceeded by the patient meekness with which it was endured. Here are no expressions of malice, no invocations even of God's retributive justice, not a complaint of suffering wrongfully. On the contrary, praise to God, forgiveness of sin, and a forgiving all the world, concludes this unaffected interesting narrative. Bonner's admiration was excited by the steadfast coolness of this martyr. Speaking of Mr. Simpson in the consistory, he said, You see what a personable man he is, and that of his patience, I affirm, that, if he were not a heretic, he is a man of the greatest patience that ever came before me. Thrice in one day has he been racked in the tower, in my house also he has felt sorrow, and yet never have I seen his patience broken. The day before this pious deacon was to be condemned, while in the stocks in the bishop's coalhouse, he had the vision of a glorified form, which much encouraged him. This he certainly attested to his wife, to Mr. Austin, and others, before his death. With this ornament of the Christian Reformation were apprehended Mr. Hugh Fox and John Devinish, the three were brought before Bonner, March 19, 1558, and the papistical articles tendered. They rejected them and were all condemned. As they worshipped together in the same society, at Islington, so they suffered together in Smithfield, March 28, in whose death the God of grace was glorified, and true believers confirmed. Thomas Hudson, Thomas Carman, and William Seaman were condemned by a bigoted vicar of Aylesbury, named Barry. The spot of execution was called Lollard's Pit, without Bishopsgate, at Norwich. After joining together in humble petition to the throne of grace, they rose, went to the stake, and were encircled with their chains. To the great surprise of the spectators, Hudson slipped from under his chains, and came forward. A great opinion prevailed that he was about to recant, others thought that he wanted further time. In the meantime, his companions at the stake urged every promise and exhortation to support him. The hopes of the enemies of the cross, however, were disappointed, the good man, far from fearing the smallest personal terror at the approaching pangs of death, was only alarmed that his Saviour's face seemed to be hidden from him. Falling upon his knees, his spirit wrestled with God, and God verified the words of his Son, Ask, and it shall be given. The martyr rose in an ecstasy of joy, and exclaimed, Now, I thank God, I am strong. And care not what man can do to me. With an unruffled countenance he replaced himself under the chain, joined his fellow sufferers, and with them suffered death, to the comfort of the godly, and the confusion of Antichrist. Barry, unsatiated with this demoniacal act, summoned up two hundred persons in the town of Aylsham, whom he compelled to kneel to the cross at Pentecost, and inflicted other punishments. He struck a poor man for a trifling word, with a flail, which proved fatal to the unoffending object. 
He also gave a woman named Alice Oxes so heavy a blow with his fist, as she met him entering the hall when he was in an ill humor, that she died with the violence. This priest was rich, and possessed great authority, he was a reprobate, and, like the priesthood, he abstained from marriage, to enjoy the more a debauched and licentious life. The Sunday after the death of Queen Mary, he was reveling with one of his concubines, before Vespers, he then went to church, administered baptism, and in his return to his lascivious pastime, he was smitten by the hand of God. Without a moment given for repentance, he fell to the ground, and a groan was the only articulation permitted him. In him we may behold the difference between the end of a martyr and a persecutor. The Story of Roger Holland In a retired close near a field, in Islington, a company of decent persons had assembled, to the number of forty. While they were religiously engaged in praying and expounding the scripture, twenty-seven of them were carried before Sir Roger Chomley. Some of the women made their escape, twenty-two were committed to Newgate, who continued in prison seven weeks. Previous to their examination, they were informed by the keeper, Alexander, that nothing more was requisite to procure their discharge, than to hear Massachusetts easy as this condition may seem, these martyrs valued their purity of conscience more than loss of life or property, hence, thirteen were burnt, seven in Smithfield, and six at Brentford, two died in prison, and the other seven were providentially preserved. The names of the seven who suffered were, H. Pond, R. Fessland, R. Southine, M. Rickarby, J. F. Floyd, J. Holliday, and Roger Holland. They were sent to Newgate, June 16, 1558, and executed on the 27th. This Roger Holland, a merchant tailor of London, was first an apprentice with one Master Kemption at the Black Boy in Waddling Street, giving himself to dancing, fencing, gaming, banqueting, and wanton company. He had received for his master certain money, to the sum of thirty pounds, and lost every groated dice. Therefore he purposed to convey himself away beyond the seas, either into France or into Flanders. With this resolution, he called early in the morning on a discreet servant in the house, named Elizabeth, who professed the gospel, and lived a life that did honor to her profession. To her he revealed the loss his folly had occasioned, regretted that he had not followed her advice, and begged her to give his master a note of hand from him acknowledging the debt, which he would repay if ever it were in his power, he also entreated his disgraceful conduct might be kept secret, lest it would bring the gray hairs to his father with sorrow to a premature grave. The maid, with a generosity and Christian principle rarely surpassed, conscious that his imprudence might be his ruin, brought him the thirty pounds, which was part of a sum of money recently left her by legacy. Here, said she, is the sum requisite, you shall take the money, and I will keep the note, but expressly on this condition, that you abandon all lewd and vicious company, that you neither swear nor talk immodestly, and gain no more, for, should I learn that you do, I will immediately show this note to your master. I also require, that you shall promise me to attend the daily lecture at All Hallows, and the sermon at St. Paul's every Sunday, that you cast away all your books of popery, and in their place substitute the testament and the book of service, and that you read the scriptures with reverence and fear, calling upon God for his grace to direct you in his truth. Pray also fervently to God, to pardon your former offenses, and not to remember the sins of your youth, and would you obtain his favor ever dread to break his laws or offend his majesty? So shall God have you in his keeping, and grant you your heart's desire. We must honor the memory of this excellent domestic, whose pious endeavors were equally directed to benefit the thoughtless youth in this life and that which is to come. God did not suffer the wish of this excellent domestic to be thrown upon a barren soil, within half a year after the licentious Holland became a zealous professor of the gospel, and was an instrument of conversion to his father and others whom he visited in Lancashire, to their spiritual comfort and reformation from popery. His father, pleased with his change of conduct, gave him forty pounds to commence business within London. Then Roger repaired to London again, and came to the maid that lent him the money to pay his master withal, and said unto her, Elizabeth, here is thy money I borrowed of thee, and for the friendship, good will, and the good counsel I have received at thy hands, to recompense thee I am not able, otherwise than to make thee my wife. And soon after they were married, which was in the first year of Queen Mary. After this he remained in the congregations of the faithful, until, the last year of Queen Mary, he, with the six others aforesaid, were taken. And after Roger Holland there was none suffered in Smithfield for the testimony of the gospel, God be thanked. Flagellations by Bonner When this Catholic hyena found that neither persuasions, threats, nor imprisonment, could produce any alteration in the mind of a youth named Thomas Hinshaw, 
he sent him to Fulham, and during the first night set him in the stocks, with no other allowance than bread and water. The following morning he came to see if this punishment had worked any change in his mind, and finding none, he sent Dr. Harpsfield, his archdeacon, to converse with him. The doctor was soon out of humor at his replies, called in peevish boy, and asked him if he thought he went about to damn his soul? I am persuaded, said Thomas, that you labor to promote the dark kingdom of the devil, not for the love of the truth. These words the doctor conveyed to the bishop, who, in a passion that almost prevented articulation, came to Thomas, and said, Dost thou answer my archdeacon thus, thou naughty boy? But I'll soon handle thee well enough for it, be assured. Two willow twigs were then brought him, and causing the unresisting youth to kneel against a long bench in an arbor in his garden, he scourged him until he was compelled to cease for want of breath and fatigue. One of the rods was worn quite away. Many other conflicts did Hinsaw undergo from the bishop, who, at length, to remove him effectually, procured false witnesses to lay articles against him, all of which the young man denied, and, in short, refused to answer any interrogatories administered to him. A fortnight after this, the young man was attacked by a burning ague, and at the request of his master. Mr. Pugson, of St. Paul's Churchyard, he was removed, the bishop not doubting that he had given him his death in the natural way, he however remained ill above a year, and in the meantime Queen Mary died, by which act of providence he escaped Bonner's rage. John Wiles was another faithful person, on whom the scourging hand of Bonner fell. He was the brother of Richard Wiles, before mentioned, burnt at Brentford. Hinshaw and Wiles were confined in Bonner's coal house together, and afterward removed to Fulham, where he and Hinshaw remained during eight or ten days, in the stocks. Bonner's persecuting spirit betrayed itself in his treatment of Wiles during his examinations, often striking him on the head with a stick, seizing him by the ears, and filliping him under the chin, saying he held down his head like a thief. This producing no signs of recantation, he took him into his orchard, and in a small arbor there he flogged him first with a willow rod, and then with birch, until he was exhausted. This cruel ferocity arose from the answer of the poor sufferer, who, upon being asked how long it was since he had crept to the cross, replied, not since he had come to years of discretion, nor would he, though he should be torn to pieces by wild horses. Bonner then bade him make the sign of the cross on his forehead, which he refused to do, and thus was led to the orchard. One day, when in the stocks, Bonner asked him how he liked his lodging and fare. Well enough, said Wiles, might I have a little straw to sit or lie upon. Just at this time came in Wiles' wife, then largely pregnant, and entreated the bishop for her husband, boldly declaring that she would be delivered in the house, if he were not suffered to go with her. To get rid of the good wife's importunity, and the trouble of a lying-in woman in his palace, he bade Wiles make the sign of the cross, and say, In nomine patris, et filii, et spiritus sancti, amen. Wiles omitted the sign, and repeated the words, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Bonner would have the words repeated in Latin, to which Wiles made no objection, knowing the meaning of the words. He was then permitted to go home with his wife, his kinsman Robert was being charged to bring him to a stay. Pauls the next day, whither he himself went, and subscribing to a Latin instrument of little importance, was liberated. This is the last of the twenty-two taken at Islington. Reverend Richard Yeoman This devout aged person was curate to Dr. Taylor, at Hadley, and eminently qualified for his sacred function. Dr. Taylor left him the curacy at his departure, but no sooner had Mr. Newell gotten the benefice than he removed Mr. Yeoman and substituted a Romish priest. After this he wandered from place to place, exhorting all men to stand faithfully to God's word, earnestly to give themselves unto prayer, with patience to bear the cross now laid upon them for their trial, with boldness to confess the truth before their adversaries, and with an undoubted hope to wait for the crown and reward of eternal felicity. But when he perceived his adversaries lay wait for him, he went into Kent, and with a little packet of laces, pins, points, etc., he travelled from village to village, selling such things, and in this manner subsisted himself, his wife, and children. At last Justice Moyle, of Kent, took Mr. Yeoman, and set him in the stocks a day and a night, but, having no evident matter to charge him with, he let him go again. Coming secretly again to Hadley, he tarried with his poor wife, who kept him privately, in a chamber of the townhouse, commonly called the Guildhall, more than a year. During this time the good old father abode in a chamber locked up all the day, spending his time in devout prayer, 
in reading the scriptures, and in carting the wool which his wife spun. His wife also begged bread for herself and her children, by which precarious means they supported themselves. Thus the saints of God sustained hunger and misery, while the prophets of Baal lived in festivity, and were costily pampered at Jezebel's table. Information being at length given to Newell, that Yeoman was secreted by his wife, he came, attended by the constables, and broke into the room where the object of his search lay in bed with his wife. He reproached the poor woman with being a whore, and would have indecently pulled the clothes off, but Yeoman resisted both this act of violence and the attack upon his wife's character, adding that he defied the Pope and Popery. He was then taken out, and set in stocks until day. In the cage also with him was an old man, named John Dale, who had sat there three or four days, for exhorting the people during the time service was performing by Newell and his curate. His words were, O oh, miserable and blind guides, will ye ever be blind leaders of the blind? Will ye never amend? Will ye never see the truth of God's word? Will neither God's threats nor promises enter into your hearts? Will the blood of the martyrs nothing mollify your stony stomachs? O oh, obdurate, hard-hearted, perverse, and crooked generation! To whom nothing can do good. These words he spake in fervency of spirit against the superstitious religion of Rome, wherefore Newell caused him forthwith to be attached, and set in the stocks in a cage, where he was kept until Sir Henry Doyle, a justice, came to Hadley. When Yeoman was taken, the parson called earnestly upon Sir Henry Doyle to send them both to prison. Sir Henry Doyle as earnestly entreated the parson to consider the age of the men, and their mean condition, they were neither persons of note nor preachers, wherefore he proposed to let them be punished a day or two and to dismiss them, at least John Dale, who was no priest, and therefore, as he had so long sat in the cage, he thought it punishment enough for this time. When the parson heard this, he was exceedingly mad, and in a great rage called them pestilent heretics, unfit to live in the commonwealth of Christians. Sir Henry, fearing to appear too merciful, Yeoman and Dale were pinioned, bound like thieves with their legs under the horses' bellies, and carried to Bury Jail, where they were laid in irons, and because they continually rebuked popery, they were carried into the lowest dungeon, where John Dale, through the jail sickness and evil keeping, died soon after, his body was thrown out, and buried in the fields. He was a man of sixty-six years of age, a weaver by occupation, well learned in the holy scriptures, steadfast in his confession of the true doctrines of Christ as set forth in King Edward's time, for which he joyfully suffered prison in chains, and from this worldly dungeon he departed in Christ to eternal glory, and the blessed paradise of everlasting felicity. After Dale's death, Yeoman was removed to Norwich prison, where, after straight and evil keeping, he was examined upon his faith and religion, and required to submit himself to his holy father the Pope. I defy him, quoth he, and all his detestable abomination, I will in no wise have to do with him. The chief articles objected to him were his marriage and the mass sacrifice. Finding he continued steadfast in the truth, he was condemned, degraded, and not only burnt, but most cruelly tormented in the fire. Thus he ended this poor and miserable life, and entered into that blessed bosom of Abraham, enjoying with Lazarus that rest which God has prepared for his elect. Thomas Benbridge Mr. Benbridge was a single gentleman in the Diocese of Winchester. He might have lived a gentleman's life in the wealthy possessions of this world, but he chose rather to enter through the straight gate of persecution to the heavenly possession of life in the Lord's kingdom than to enjoy present pleasure with disquietude of conscience. Manfully standing against the papists for the defense of the sincere doctrine of Christ's gospel, he was apprehended as an adversary to the Romish religion, and led for examination before the Bishop of Winchester, where he underwent several conflicts for the truth against the bishop and his colleague, for which he was condemned, and sometime after brought to the place of martyrdom by Sir Richard Pexell, sheriff. When standing at the stake he began to untie his points, and to prepare himself, then he gave his gown to the keeper, by way of fee. His jerkin was trimmed with gold lace, which he gave to Sir Richard Pexell, the high sheriff. His cap of velvet he took from his head, and threw away. Then, lifting his mind to the Lord, he engaged in prayer. When fastened to the stake, Dr. Seaton begged him to recant, and he should have his pardon, but when he saw that nothing availed, he told the people not to pray for him unless he would recant, no more than they would pray for a dog. Mr. Benbridge, standing at the stake with his hands together in such a manner as the priest holds his hands in his memento, Dr. Seaton came to him again, and exhorted him to recant, to whom he said, Away, Babylon, away! 
One that stood by said, sir, cut his tongue out, another, a temporal man, railed at him worse than Dr. Seaton had done. When they saw he would not yield, they bade the tormentors to light the pile, before he was in any way covered with faggots. The fire first took away a piece of his beard, at which he did not shrink. Then it came on the other side and took his legs, and the nether stockings of his hose being leather, they made the fire pierce the sharper, so that the intolerable heat made him exclaim, I recant, and suddenly he trussed the fire from him. Two or three of his friends being by, wished to save him, they stepped to the fire to help remove it, for which kindness they were sent to jail. The sheriff also of his own authority took him from the stake, and remitted him to prison, for which he was sent to the fleet, and lay there some time. Before, however, he was taken from the stake, Dr. Seaton wrote articles for him to subscribe to. To these Mr. Benbridge made so many objections that Dr. Seaton ordered them to set fire again to the pile. Then with much pain and grief of heart he subscribed to them upon a man's back. This done, his gown was given him again, and he was led to prison. While there, he wrote a letter to Dr. Seaton, recanting those words he had spoken at the stake, and the articles which he had subscribed, for he was grieved that he had ever signed them. The same day a sea night he was again brought to the stake, where the vile tormentors rather broiled than burnt him. The Lord give his enemies repentance. Mrs. Prest from the number condemned in this fanatical reign, it is almost impossible to obtain the name of every martyr, or to embellish the history of all with anecdotes and exemplifications of Christian conduct. Thanks be to Providence, our cruel task begins to draw towards a conclusion, with the end of the reign of papal terror and bloodshed. Monarchs, who sit upon thrones possessed by hereditary right, should, of all others, consider that the laws of nature are the laws of God, and hence that the first law of nature is the preservation of their subjects. Maxims of persecutions, of torture, and of death, they should leave to those who have affected sovereignty by fraud or by sword, but where, except among a few miscreant emperors of Rome, and the Roman pontiffs, shall we find one whose memory is so damned to everlasting fame as that of Queen Mary? Nations bewail the hour which separates them forever from a beloved governor, but, with respect to that of Mary, it was the most blessed time of her whole reign. Heaven has ordained three great scourges for national sins plague, pestilence, and famine. It was the will of God in Mary's reign to bring a fourth upon this kingdom, under the form of papistical persecution. It was sharp, but glorious, the fire which consumed the martyrs has undermined the popedom, and the Catholic states, at present the most bigoted and unenlightened, are those which are sunk lowest in the scale of moral dignity and political consequence. May they remain so, until the pure light of the gospel shall dissipate the darkness of fanaticism and superstition. But to return. Mrs. Prest for some time lived about Cornwall, where she had a husband and children, whose bigotry compelled her to frequent the abominations of the Church of Rome. Resolving to act as her conscience dictated, she quitted them, and made a living by spinning. After some time, returning home, she was accused by her neighbors, and brought to Exeter, to be examined before Dr. Troubleville, and his Chancellor Blackston. As this martyr was accounted of inferior intellect, we shall put her in competition with the bishop, and let the reader judge which had the most of that knowledge conducive to everlasting life. The bishop bringing the question to issue, respecting the bread and wine being flesh and blood, Mrs. Press said, I will demand of you whether you can deny your creed, which says, that Christ doth perpetually sit at the right hand of his Father, both body and soul, until he come again, or whether he be there in heaven our advocate, and to make prayer for us unto God his Father? If he be so, he is not here on earth in a piece of bread. If he be not here, and if he do not dwell in temples made with hands, but in heaven, what? Shall we seek him here? If he did not offer his body once for all, why make you a new offering? If with one offering he made all perfect, why do you with a false offering make all imperfect? If he be to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, why do you worship a piece of bread? If he be eaten and drunken in faith and truth, if his flesh be not profitable to be among us, why do you say you make his flesh and blood, and say it is profitable for body and soul? Alas! I am a poor woman, but rather than to do as you do, I would live no longer. I have said, sir. Bishop. I promise you, you are a jolly Protestant. I pray you in what school have you been brought up? Mrs. Prest. 
I have upon the Sundays visited the sermons, and there have I learned such things as are so fixed in my breast, that death shall not separate them. Be, O foolish woman, who will waste his breath upon thee, or such as thou art? But how chance of it that thou wentest away from thy husband? If thou art an honest woman, thou wouldst not have left thy husband and children, and run about the country like a fugitive. Mrs. P. Sir, I labored for my living bill, and as my master Christ counseleth me, when I was persecuted in one city, I fled into another. B. Who persecuted thee? Mrs. P. My husband and my children. For when I would have them to leave idolatry, and to worship God in heaven, he would not hear me, but he with his children rebuked me, and troubled me. I fled not for whoredom, nor for theft, but because I would be no partaker with him and his of that foul idol the mass, and wheresoever I was, as oft as I could, upon Sundays and holy days. I made excuses not to go to the popish church. Be belike then you are a good housewife, to fly from your husband the church. Mrs. P. My housewifery is but small, but God gave me grace to go to the true church. Be of the true church, what dost thou mean? Mrs. P. Not your popish church, full of idols and abominations, but where two or three are gathered together in the name of God, to that church will I go as long as I live. Be belike then you have a church of your own. Well, let this mad woman be put down to prison until we send for her husband. Mrs. P. No, I have but one husband, who is here already in this city, and in prison with me, from whom I will never depart. Some persons present endeavoring to convince the bishop she was not in her right senses, she was permitted to depart. The keeper of the bishop's prisons took her into his house, where she either spun worked as a servant, or walked about the city, discoursing upon the sacrament of the altar. Her husband was sent for to take her home, but this she refused while the cause of religion could be served. She was too active to be idle, and her conversation, simple as they affected to think her, excited the attention of several Catholic priests and friars. They teased her with questions, until she answered them angrily, and this excited a laugh at her warmth. Nay, said she, you have more need to weep than to laugh, and to be sorry that ever you were born, to be the chaplains of that horror Babylon. I defy him and all his falsehood, and get you away from me, you do, but trouble my conscience. You would have me follow your doings, I will first lose my life. I pray you depart. Why, thou foolish woman, said they, we come to thee for thy profit and soul's health. To which she replied, What profit are saith by you, that teach nothing but lies for truth? How save you souls, when you preach nothing but lies, and destroy souls? How provest thou that, said they? Do you not destroy your souls, when you teach the people to worship idols, stocks, and stones, the works of men's hands? And to worship a false god of your own making of a piece of bread, and teach that the Pope is God's vicar, and hath power to forgive sins? And that there is a purgatory, when God's Son hath by his passion purged all? And say you make God and sacrifice him, when Christ's body was a sacrifice once for all? Do you not teach the people to number their sins in your ears, and say they will be damned if they confess not all? When God's word saith, who can number his sins? Do you not promise them trentals and dirges and masses for souls, and sell your prayers for money, and make them by pardons, and trust to such foolish inventions of your imaginations? Do you not altogether act against God? Do you not teach us to pray upon beads, and to pray unto saints, and say they can pray for us? Do you not make holy water and holy bread to fray devils? Do you not do a thousand more abominations? And yet you say, you come for my profit, and to save my soul. No, no, one hath saved me. Farewell, you with your salvation. During the liberty granted her by the bishop, before mentioned, she went into St. Peter's Church, and there found a skillful Dutchman, who was affixing new noses to certain fine images which had been disfigured in King Edward's time to whom she said, What a madman art thou, to make them new noses, which within a few days shall all lose their heads. The Dutchman accused her and laid it hard to her charge. And she said unto him, Thou art accursed, and so are thy images. He called her a whore. Nay, said she, thy images are whores, and thou art a whore hunter, for doth not God say, You go a whoring after strange gods, figures of your own making? And thou art one of them. After this she was ordered to be confined, and had no more liberty. 
During the time of her imprisonment, many visited her, some sent by the bishop, and some of their own will, among these was one Daniel, a great preacher of the gospel, in the days of King Edward, about Cornwall and Devonshire, but who, through the grievous persecution he had sustained, had fallen off. Earnestly did she exhort him to repent with Peter, and to be more constant in his profession. Mrs. Walter Raleigh and Mr. William and John Keed, persons of great respectability, bore ample testimony of her godly conversation, declaring, that unless God were with her, it were impossible she could have so ably defended the cause of Christ. Indeed, to sum up the character of this poor woman, she united the serpent and the dove, abounding in the highest wisdom joined to the greatest simplicity. She endured imprisonment, threatenings, taunts, and the vilest epithets, but nothing could induce her to swerve, her heart was fixed, she had cast anchor, nor could all the wounds of persecution remove her from the rock on which her hopes of felicity were built. Such was her memory, that, without learning, she could tell in what chapter any text of scripture was contained, on account of this singular property, one Gregory Bassett, a rank papist, said she was deranged, and talked as a parrot, wild without meaning. At length, having tried every manner without effect to make her nominally a Catholic, they condemned her. After this, one exhorted her to leave her opinions, and go home to her family, as she was poor and illiterate. True, said she, though I am not learned, I am content to be a witness of Christ's death, and I pray you make no longer delay with me, for my heart is fixed, and I will never say otherwise, nor turn to your superstitious doing. To the disgrace of Mr. Blackston, treasurer of the church, he would often send for this poor martyr from prison, to make sport for him and a woman whom he kept, putting religious questions to her and turning her answers into ridicule. This done, he sent her back to her wretched dungeon, while he battened upon the good things of this world. There was perhaps something simply ludicrous in the form of Mrs. Prest, as she was of a very short stature, thick set, and about fifty-four years of age, but her countenance was cheerful and lively, as if prepared for the day of her marriage with the Lamb. To mock at her form was an indirect accusation of her creator, who framed her after the fashion he liked best, and gave her a mind that far excelled the transient endowments of perishable flesh. When she was offered money, she rejected it, because, said she, I am going to a city where money bears no mastery, and while I am here God has promised to feed me. When sentence was read, condemning her to the flames, she lifted up her voice and praised God, adding, This day have I found that which I have long sought. When they tempted her to recant, that will I not, said she, God forbid that I should lose the life eternal, for this carnal and short life. I will never turn from my heavenly husband to my earthly husband, from the fellowship of angels to mortal children, and if my husband and children be faithful, then am I theirs. God is my father, God is my mother, God is my sister, my brother, my kinsman, God is my friend, most faithful. Being delivered to the sheriff, she was led by the officer to the place of execution, without the walls of Exeter, called Southerny, where again the superstitious priests assaulted her. While they were tying her to the stake, she continued earnestly to exclaim God be merciful to me, a sinner. Patiently enduring the devouring conflagration, she was consumed to ashes, and thus ended a life which an unshaken fidelity to the cause of Christ, was not surpassed by that of any preceding martyr. Richard Sharp, Thomas Banyan, and Thomas Hale Mr. Sharp, Weaver, of Bristol, was brought the ninth day of March, 1556, before Dr. Dalby, Chancellor of the City of Bristol, and after examination concerning the sacrament of the altar, was persuaded to recant, and on the 29th, he was enjoined to make his recantation in the parish church. He was burnt the 7th of May, 1558, and died godly, patiently, and constantly, confessing the Protestant articles of faith with him suffered Thomas Hale, shoemaker, of Bristol, who was condemned by Chnaller Dalby. These martyrs were bound back to back. He was burnt the 7th of May, 1558, and died godly, patiently, and constantly, confessing the Protestant articles of faith with him suffered Thomas Hale, shoemaker, of Bristol, who was condemned by Chnaller Dalby. These martyrs were bound back to back. Thomas Banyan, a weaver, was burnt on August 27th of the same year, and died for the sake of the evangelical cause of his Saviour. J. Corniford, of Wortham, C. Brown, of Maidstone, J. Hurst, of Ashford, Alice Snoth, and Catherine Knight, an aged woman. With pleasure we have to record that these five martyrs were the last who suffered in the reign of Mary for the sake of the Protestant cause, but the malice of the Papists was conspicuous in hastening their martyrdom, which might have been delayed until the event of the Queen's illness was decided. 
It is reported that the Archdeacon of Canterbury, judging that the sudden death of the Queen would suspend the execution, travelled post from London, to have the satisfaction of adding another page to the blacklist of papistical sacrifices. The articles against them were, as usual, the sacramental elements and the idolatry of bending to images. They quoted St. John's words, beware of images, and respecting the real presence, they urged according to St. Paul, the things which are seen are temporal. Thy true religion may be known to thy great glory and our comfort and to the edifying of all our nation. Good Lord, so be it. Amen. Thy true religion may be known to thy great glory and our comfort and to the edifying of all our nation. Good Lord, so be it. Amen. This sentence was openly pronounced and registered, and, as if Providence had awarded that it should not be delivered in vain, within six days after, Queen Mary died, detested by all good men and accursed of God. Though acquainted with these circumstances, the archdeacon's implacability exceeded that of his great exemplary, Bonner, who, though he had several persons at that time under his fiery grasp, did not urge their deaths hastily, by which delay he certainly afforded them an opportunity of escape. At the Queen's decease, many were in bonds, some just taken, some examined, and others condemned. The writs indeed were issued for several burnings, but by the death of the three instigators of Protestant murder the Chancellor, the Bishop, and the Queen, who fell nearly together, the condemned sheep were liberated, and lived many years to praise God for their happy deliverance. These five martyrs, when at the stake, earnestly prayed that their blood might be the last shed, nor did they pray in vain. They died gloriously, and perfected the number God had selected to bear witness of the truth in this dreadful reign, whose names are recorded in the Book of Life, though last, not least among the saints made meet for immortality through the redeeming blood of the Lamb. Catherine Finley, alias Knight, was first converted by her sons expounding the scriptures to her, which wrought in her a perfect work that terminated in martyrdom. Alice Snoth at the stake sent for her grandmother and godfather, and rehearsed to them the articles of her faith, and the commandments of God, thereby convincing the world that she knew her duty. She died calling upon the spectators to bear witness that she was a Christian woman, and suffered joyfully for the testimony of Christ's gospel. Among the numberless enormities committed by the merciless and unfeeling Bonner, the murder of this innocent and unoffending child may be ranged as the most horrid. His father, John Fetty, of the parish of Clerkenwell, by trade a tailor, and only twenty-four years of age, had made blessed election, he was fixed secure in eternal hope, and depended on him who so builds his church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But alas! The very wife of his bosom, whose heart was hardened against the truth, and whose mind was influenced by the teachers of false doctrine, became his accuser. Brokenberry, a creature of the Pope and parson of the parish, received the information of this wedded Delilah, in consequence of which the poor man was apprehended. But here the awful judgment of an ever-righteous God, who is of purer eyes than to behold evil, fell upon this stone-hearted and perfidious woman, for no sooner was the injured husband captured by her wicked contriving, than she also was suddenly seized with madness, and exhibited an awful and awakening instance of God's power to punish the evildoer. This dreadful circumstance had some effect upon the hearts of the ungodly hunters who had eagerly grasped their prey, but, in a relenting moment, they suffered him to remain with his unworthy wife, to return her good for evil, and to comfort two children, who, on his being sent to prison, would have been left without a protector, or have become a burden to the parish. As bad men act from little motives, we may place the indulgence shown him to the latter account. We have noticed in the former part of our narratives of the martyrs, some whose affection would have led them even to sacrifice their own lives, to preserve their husbands, but here, agreeable to scripture language, a mother proves, indeed, a monster in nature. Neither conjugal nor maternal affection could impress the heart of this disgraceful woman. Although our afflicted Christian had experienced so much cruelty and falsehood from the woman who was bound to him by every type both human and divine, yet, with a mild and forbearing spirit, he overlooked her misdeeds, during her calamity endeavoring all he could to procure relief for her malady, and soothing her by every possible expression of tenderness, thus she became in a few weeks nearly restored to her senses. But, alas! She returned again to her sin, as a dog returneth to his vomit. Malice against the saints of the Most High was seated in her heart too firmly to be removed, and as her strength returned, her inclination to work wickedness returned with it. Her heart was hardened by the prince of darkness, and to her may be applied these afflicting and soul-harrowing words, can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? 
then may ye also do good, that are accustomed to do evil. Weighing this text duly with another, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, how shall we presume to refine away the sovereignty of God by arranging Jehovah at the bar of human reason, which, in religious matters, is too often opposed by infinite wisdom? Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The ways of heaven are indeed inscrutable, and it is our bounden duty to walk ever dependent on God, looking up to Him with humble confidence, and hope in His goodness, and ever confess His justice, and where we cannot unravel, there learn to trust. This wretched woman, pursuing the horrid dictates of a heart hardened and depraved, was scarcely confirmed in her recovery, when, stifling the dictates of honor, gratitude, and every natural affection, she again accused her husband, who was once more apprehended, and taken before Sir John Mordaunt, knight, and one of Queen Mary's commissioners. Upon examination, his judge finding him fixed in opinions which militated against those nursed by superstition and maintained by cruelty, he was sentenced to confinement and torture in Lalit's tower. Here he was put into the painful stocks, and had a dish of water set by him, with a stone put into it, to what purpose God knoweth, except it were to show that he should look for little other subsistence, which is credible enough, if we consider their like practices upon diverse before mentioned in this history, as, among others, upon Richard Smith, who died through their cruel imprisonment touching whom, when a godly woman came to Dr. Story to have. Leave she might bury him, he asked her if he had any straw or blood in his mouth, but what he means thereby, I leave to the judgment of the wise. On the first day of the third week of our martyr's sufferings, an object presented itself to his view, which made him indeed feel his tortures with all their force, and to execrate, with bitterness only short of cursing, the author of his misery. To mark and punish the proceedings of his tormentors, remained with the Most High, who noteth even the fall of a sparrow, and in whose sacred word it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. This object was his own son, a child of the tender age of eight years. For fifteen days, had its hapless father been suspended by his tormentor by the right arm and left leg, and sometimes by both, shifting his positions for the purpose of giving him strength to bear and to lengthen the date of his sufferings. When the unoffending innocent, desirous of seeing and speaking to its parent, applied to Bonner for permission to do so, the poor child, being asked by the bishop's chaplain the purport of his errand, he replied he wished to see his father. Who is thy father? said the chaplain. John Fetty returned the boy, at the same time pointing to the place where he was confined. The interrogating miscreant on this said, Why, thy father is a heretic. The little champion again rejoined, with energy sufficient to raise admiration in any breast, except that of this unprincipled and unfeeling wretch this miscreant, eager to execute the behests of a remorseless queen dash my father is no heretic, for you have Balaam's mark. Irritated by reproach so aptly applied, the indignant and mortified priest concealed his resentment for a moment, and took the undaunted boy into the house, where having him secure, he presented him to others, whose baseness and cruelty being equal to his own, they stripped him to the skin, and applied their scourges to so violent a degree, that, fainting beneath the stripes inflicted on his tender frame, and covered with the blood that flowed from them, the victim of their ungodly wrath was ready to expire under his heavy and unmerited punishment. In this bleeding and helpless state was the suffering infant, covered only with his shirt, taken to his father by one of the actors in the horrid tragedy, who, while he exhibited the heart-rending spectacle, made use of the vilest taunts, and exulted in what he had done. The dutiful child, as if recovering strength at the sight of his father, on his knees implored his blessing. Alas! Will, said the afflicted parent, in trembling amazement, who hath done this to thee, the artless innocent related the circumstances that led to the merciless correction which had been so basely inflicted on him, but when he repeated the reproof bestowed on the chaplain, and which was prompted by an undaunted spirit, he was torn from his weeping parent, and conveyed again to the house, where he remained a close prisoner. Bonner, somewhat fearful that what had been done could not be justified even among the bloodhounds of his own voracious pack, concluded in his dark and wicked mind, to release John Fetty, for a time at least, from the severities he was enduring in the glorious cause of everlasting truth, whose bright rewards are fixed beyond the boundaries of time, within the confines of eternity, where the arrow of the wicked cannot wound, even where there shall be no more sorrowing for the blessed, who, in the mansion of eternal bliss shall glorify the Lamb forever and ever. He was accordingly by order of Bonner, how disgraceful to all dignity, to say Bishop. 
liberated from the painful bonds and led from Lalit's tower to the chamber of that ungodly and infamous butcher, where he found the bishop bathing himself before a great fire, and at his first entering the chamber, Fetty said, God be here in peace. God be here in peace, said Bonner, that is neither Godspeed nor good morrow. If he kick against this peace, said Fetty, then this is not the place that I seek for. A chaplain of the bishop, standing by, turned the poor man about, and thinking to abash him, said, in mocking wise, what have we here a player? While Fetty was thus standing in the bishop's chamber, he espied, hanging about the bishop's bed, a pair of great black beads, whereupon he said, My lord, I think the hangman is not far off, for the halter, pointing to the beads, is here already. At which words the bishop was in a marvellous rage. Then he immediately after espied also, standing in the bishop's chamber, in the window, a little crucifix. Then he asked the bishop what it was, and he answered, that it was Christ. Was he handled as cruelly as he is here pictured, said Fetty. Yeah, that he was, said the bishop. And even so cruelly will you handle such as come before you, for you are unto God's people as Caiaphas was unto Christ. The bishop, being in a great fury, said, Thou art a vile heretic, and I will burn thee, or else I will spend all I have, unto my gown. Nay, my lord, said Fetty, you were better to give it to some poor body, that he may pray for you. Bonner, notwithstanding his passion, which was raised to the utmost by the calm and pointed remarks of this observing Christian, thought it most prudent to dismiss the father, on account of the nearly murdered child. His coward soul trembled for the consequences which might ensue, fear is inseparable from little minds, and this dastardly pampered priest experienced its effects so far as to induce him to assume the appearance of that he was an utter stranger to, namely, mercy. The father, on being dismissed, by the tyrant Bonner, went home with a heavy heart, with his dying child, who did not survive many days the cruelties which had been inflicted on him. How contrary to the will of our great king and prophet, who mildly taught his followers, was the conduct of this sanguinary and false teacher, this vile apostate from his God to Satan. But the archfiend had taken entire possession of his heart, and guided every action of the sinner he had hardened, who, given up to terrible destruction, was running the race of the wicked, marking his footsteps with the blood of the saints, as if eager to arrive at the goal of eternal death. Deliverance of Dr. Sands This eminent prelate, vice-chancellor of Cambridge, at the request of the Duke of Northumberland, when he came down to Cambridge in support of Lady Jane Grey's claim to the throne, undertook at a few hours' notice, to preach before the Duke and the University. The text he took was such as presented itself in opening the Bible, and a more appropriate one he could not have chosen, namely, the three last verses of Joshua. As God gave him the text, so he gave him also such order and utterance that it excited the most lively emotions in his numerous auditors. The sermon was about to be sent to London to be printed, when news arrived that the Duke had returned and Queen Mary was proclaimed. The Duke was immediately arrested, and Dr. Sands was compelled by the university to give up his office. He was arrested by the Queen's order, and when Mr. Mildmay wondered that so learned a man could willfully incur danger, and speak against so good a princess as Mary, the doctor replied, If I would do as Mr. Mildmay has done, I need not fear bonds. He came down armed against Queen Mary, before a traitor now a great friend. I cannot with one mouth blow hot and cold in this manner. A general plunder of Dr. Sands' property ensued, and he was brought to London upon a wretched horse. Various insults he met on the way from the bigoted Catholics, and as he passed through Bishop's Gate Street, a stone struck him to the ground. He was the first prisoner that entered the tower, in that day, on a religious account, his man was admitted with his Bible, but his shirts and other articles were taken from him. On Mary's coronation day the doors of the dungeon were so laxly guarded that it was easy to escape. A Mr. Mitchell, like a true friend, came to him, afforded him his own clothes as a disguise, and was willing to abide the consequence of being found in his place. This was a rare friendship, but he refused the offer, saying, I know no cause why I should be in prison. To do thus were to make myself guilty. I will expect God's good will, yet do I think myself much obliged to you, and so Mr. Mitchell departed. With Dr. Sands was imprisoned Mr. Bradford, they were kept close in prison twenty nine weeks. John Fowler, their keeper, was a perverse papist, yet, by often persuading him, at length he began to favor the gospel, and was so persuaded in the true religion, that on a Sunday, when they had mass in the chapel, Dr. Sands administered the communion to Bradford and to Fowler. Thus Fowler was their son begotten in bonds. 
To make room for Wyatt and his accomplices, Dr. Sands and nine other preachers were sent to the Marshalsea. The keeper of the Marshalsea appointed to every preacher a man to lead him in the street, he caused them to go on before, and he and Dr. Sands followed conversing together. By this time Popery began to be unsavory. After they had passed the bridge, the keeper said to Dr. Sands, I perceive the vain people would set you forward to the fire. You are as vain as they, if you, being a young man, will stand in your own conceit, and prefer your own judgment before that of so many worthy prelates, ancient, learned, and grave men as be in this realm. If you do so, you shall find me a severe keeper, and one that utterly dislikes your religion. Dr. Sands answered, I know my years to be young, and my learning but small, it is enough to know Christ crucified, and he hath learned nothing who seeth not the great blasphemy that is in popery. I will yield unto God, and not unto man. I have read in the scriptures of many godly and caritas keepers, may God make you one. If not, I trust he will give me strength and patience to bear your hard usage. Then said the keeper, Are you resolved to stand to your religion? Yes, quoth the doctor, by God's grace. Truly, said the keeper, I love you the better for it, I did but tempt you, what favor I can show you, you shall be assured of, and I shall think myself happy if I might die at the stake with you. He was as good as his word, for he trusted the doctor to walk in the fields alone, or he met with Mr. Bradford, who was also a prisoner in the king's bench, and had found the same favor from his keeper. At his request, he put Mr. Saunders in along with him, to be his bedfellow, and the communion was administered to a great number of communicants. When Wyatt with his army came to Southwark, he offered to liberate all the imprisoned Protestants, but Dr. Sands and the rest of the preachers refused to accept freedom on such terms. After Dr. Sands had been nine weeks prisoner in the Marshalsea, by the mediation of Sir Thomas Holcroft, Knight Marshal, he was set at liberty. Though Mr. Holcroft had the Queen's warrant, the bishop commanded him not to set Dr. Sands at liberty, until he had taken sureties of two gentlemen with him, each one bound in OE500, that Dr. Sands should not depart out of the realm without license. Mr. Holcroft immediately after met with two gentlemen of the North, friends and cousins to Dr. Sands, who offered to be bound for him. After dinner, the same day, Sir Thomas Holcroft sent for Dr. Sands to his lodgings at Westminster, to communicate to him all he had done. Dr. Sands answered, I give God thanks, who hath moved your heart to mind me so well, that I think myself most bound unto you. God shall requite you, nor shall I ever be found unthankful. But as you have dealt friendly with me, I will also deal plainly with you. I came a freeman into prison, I will not go forth a bondman. As I cannot benefit my friends, so will I not hurt them. And if I be set at liberty, I will not tarry six days in this realm, if I may get out. If therefore I may not get free forth, send me to the Marshalsea again, and there you shall be sure of me. This answer Mr. Holcroft much disapproved of, but like a true friend he replied, seeing you cannot be altered, I will change my purpose, and yield unto you. Come of it what will, I will set you at liberty, and seeing you have a mind to go over sea, get you gone as quick as you can. One thing I require of you, that, while you are there, you write nothing to me hither, for this may undo me. Dr. Sands having taken an affectionate farewell of him and his other friends in bonds, departed. He went by Winchester House, and there took boat, and came to a friend's house in London, called William Banks, and tarried there one night. The next night he went to another friend's house, and there he heard that strict search was making for him, by gardener's express order. Dr. Sands now conveyed himself by night to one Mr. Bertie's house, a stranger who was in the Marshalsea prison with him a while, he was a good Protestant and dwelt in Mark Lane. There he was six days, and then removed to one of his acquaintances in Cornhill, he caused his man Quinton to provide two geldings for him, resolved on the morrow to ride into Essex, to Mr. Sands, his father-in-law, where his wife was, which, after a narrow escape, he effected. He had not been there two hours, before Mr. Sands was told that two of the guards would that night apprehend Dr. Sands. That night Dr. Sands was guided to an honest farmer's near the sea, where he tarried two days and two nights in a chamber without company. After that he removed to one James Mowers, a shipmaster, who dwelt at Milton Shore, where he waited for a wind to Flanders. While he was there, James Mower brought to him forty or fifty mariners, to whom he gave an exhortation, they liked him so well that they promised to die rather than he should be apprehended. The 6th of May, Sunday, the wind served. In taking leave of his hostess, who had been married eight years without having a child, 
he gave her a fine handkerchief and an old royal of gold, and said, Be of good comfort, before that one whole year be passed, God shall give you a child, a boy. This came to pass, for, that day twelvemonth, wanting one day, God gave her a son. Scarcely had he arrived at Antwerp, when he learned that King Philip had sent to apprehend him. He next flew to Augsburg, in Cleveland, where Dr. Sands tarried fourteen days, and then traveled towards Strasbourg, where, after he had lived one year, his wife came to him. He was sick of a flux nine months, and had a child which died of the plague. His amiable wife at length fell into a consumption, and died in his arms. When his wife was dead, he went to Zurich, and there was in Peter Martyr's house for the space of five weeks. As they sat at dinner one day, word was suddenly brought that Queen Mary was dead, and Dr. Sands was sent for by his friends at Strasbourg, where he preached. Mr. Grindel and he came over to England, and arrived in London the same day that Queen Elizabeth was crowned. This faithful servant of Christ, under Queen Elizabeth, rose to the highest distinction in the church, being successively Bishop of Worcester, Bishop of London, and Archbishop of York. Queen Mary's Treatment of Her Sister, the Princess Elizabeth the preservation of Princess Elizabeth may be reckoned a remarkable instance of the watchful eye which Christ had over his church. The bigotry of Mary regarded not the ties of consanguinity, of natural affection, of national succession. Her mind, physically morose, was under the dominion of men who possessed not the milk of human kindness, and whose principles were sanctioned and enjoined by the idolatrous tenets of the Romish pontiff. Could they have foreseen the short date of Mary's reign, they would have imbrued their hands in the Protestant blood of Elizabeth, and, as a sine qua non of the Queen's salvation, have compelled her to bequeath the kingdom to some Catholic prince. The contest might have been attended with the horrors incidental to a religious civil war, and calamities might have been felt in England similar to those under Henry the Great in France, whom Queen Elizabeth assisted in opposing his priest-ridden Catholic subjects. As if Providence had the perpetual establishment of the Protestant faith in view, the difference of the duration of the two reigns is worthy of notice. Mary might have reigned many years in the course of nature, but the course of grace willed it otherwise. Five years and four months was the time of persecution allotted to this weak, disgraceful reign, while that of Elizabeth reckoned a number of years among the highest of those who have sat on the English throne, almost nine times that of her merciless sister. Before Mary attained the crown, she treated Elizabeth with a sisterly kindness, but from that period her conduct was altered, and the most imperious distance substituted. Though Elizabeth had no concern in the rebellion of Sir Thomas Wyatt, yet she was apprehended, and treated as a culprit in that commotion. The manner too of her arrest was similar to the mind that dictated it, the three cabinet members, whom she deputed to see the arrest executed, rudely entered the chamber at ten o'clock at night, and, though she was extremely ill, they could scarcely be induced to let her remain until the following morning. Her enfeebled state permitted her to be moved only by short stages in a journey of such length to London, but the princess, though afflicted in person, had a consolation in mind which her sister never could purchase, the people, through whom she passed on her way pitied her, and put up their prayers for her preservation. Arrived at court, she was made a close prisoner for a fortnight, without knowing who was her accuser, or seeing anyone who could console or advise her. The charge, however, was at length unmasked by Gardiner, who, with nineteen of the council, accused her of abetting Wyatt's conspiracy, which she religiously affirmed to be false. Failing in this, they placed against her the transactions of Sir Peter Carew in the West, in which they were as unsuccessful as in the former. The Queen now signified that it was her pleasure she should be committed to the Tower, a step which overwhelmed the Princess with the greatest alarm and uneasiness. In vain she hoped the Queen's Majesty would not commit her to such a place, but there was no lenity to be expected, her attendants were limited, and a hundred northern soldiers appointed to guard her day and night. On Palm Sunday she was conducted to the tower. When she came to the palace garden, she cast her eyes towards the windows, eagerly anxious to meet those of the Queen, but she was disappointed. A strict order was given in London that everyone should go to church and carry palms, that she might be conveyed without clamor or commiseration to her prison. At the time of passing under London Bridge the fall of the tide made it very dangerous, and the barge sometimes stuck fast against the starlings. To mortify her the more, she was landed at Traitor's Stairs. As it rained fast, and she was obliged to step in the water to land, she hesitated, but this excited no complaisance in the Lord in waiting. When she set her foot on the steps, she exclaimed, Here lands as true a subject, being prisoner, as ever landed at these stairs, 
and before thee, O God, I speak it, having no friend but thee alone. A large number of the wardens and servants of the tower were arranged in order between whom the princess had to pass. Upon inquiring the use of this parade, she was informed it was customary to do so. If, said she, it is on account of me, I beseech you that they may be dismissed. On this the poor men knelt down and prayed that God would preserve her grace, for which they were the next day turned out of their employments. The tragic scene must have been deeply interesting, to see an amiable and irreproachable princess sent like a lamb to languish in expectation of cruelty and death, against whom there was no other charge than her superiority in Christian virtues and acquired endowments. Her attendants openly wept as she proceeded with a dignified step to the frowning battlements of her destination. Alas, said Elizabeth, what do you mean? I took you to comfort, not to dismay me, for my truth is such that no one shall have cause to weep for me. The next step of her enemies was to procure evidence by means which, in the present day, are accounted detestable. Many poor prisoners were racked, to extract, if possible, any matters of accusation which might affect her life, and thereby gratify Gardiner's sanguinary disposition. He himself came to examine her, respecting her removal from her house at Ashbridge to Dunnington Castle a long while before. The princess had quite forgotten this trivial circumstance, and Lord Arundel, after the investigation, kneeling down, apologized for having troubled her in such a frivolous matter. You sift me narrowly, replied the princess, but of this I am assured, that God has appointed a limit to your proceedings, and so God forgive you all. Her own gentlemen, who ought to have been her purveyors, and served her provision, were compelled to give place to the common soldiers, at the command of the constable of the tower, who was in every respect a servile tool of gardener, her grace's friends, however, procured an order of counsel which regulated this petty tyranny more to her satisfaction. After having been a whole month in close confinement, she sent for the Lord Chamberlain and Lord Shandoy, to whom she represented the ill state of her health from a want of proper air and exercise. Application being made to the council, Elizabeth was with some difficulty admitted to walk in the Queen's lodgings, and afterwards in the garden, at which time the prisoners on that side were attended by their keepers, and not suffered to look down upon her. Their jealousy was excited by a child of four years, who daily brought flowers to the princess. The child was threatened with a whipping, and the father ordered to keep him from the princess's chambers. On the 5th of May the constable was discharged from his office, and Sir Henry Benefield appointed in his room, accompanied by a hundred ruffian-looking soldiers in blue. This measure created considerable alarm in the mind of the princess, who imagined it was preparatory to her undergoing the same fate as Lady Jane Grey, upon the same block. Assured that this project was not an agitation, she entertained an idea that the new keeper of the tower was commissioned to make away with her privately, as his equivocal character was in conformity with the ferocious inclination of those by whom he was appointed. A report now obtained that her grace was to be taken away by the new constable and his soldiers, which in the sequel proved to be true. An order of counsel was made for her removal to the manor Woodstock, which took place on Trinity Sunday, May 13, under the authority of Sir Henry Benefield and Lord Tame. The ostensible cause of her removal was to make room for other prisoners. Richmond was the first place they stopped at, and here the princess slept, not however without much alarm at first, as her own servants were superseded by the soldiers, who were placed as guards at her chamber door. Upon representation, Lord Tame overruled this indecent stretch of power, and granted her perfect safety while under his custody. In passing through Windsor, she saw several of her poor dejected servants waiting to see her. Go to them, said she, to one of her attendants, and say these words from me, tankum ovus, that is, like a sheep to the slaughter. The next night her grace lodged at the house of a Mr. Dormer, in her way to which the people manifested such tokens of loyal affection that Sir Henry was indignant, and bestowed on them very liberally the names of rebels and traitors. In some villages they rang the bells for joy, imagining the princess's arrival among them was from a very different cause, but this harmless demonstration of gladness was sufficient with the persecuting Benefield to order his soldiers to seize and set these humble persons in the stocks. The day following, her grace arrived at Lord Tame's house, where she stayed all night, and was most nobly entertained. This excited Sir Henry's indignation, and made him caution Lord Tame to look well to his proceedings, but the humanity of Lord Tame was not to be frightened, and he returned a suitable reply. At another time, this official prodigal, to show his consequence and disregard of good manners, went up into a chamber, where was appointed for her grace a chair, 
two cushions, and a foot carpet, wherein he presumptuously sat and called his man to pull off his boots. As soon as it was known to the ladies and gentlemen, they laughed him to scorn. When supper was done, he called to his lordship, and directed that all gentlemen and ladies should withdraw home marveling much that he would permit such a large company, considering the great charge he had committed to him. Sir Henry, said his lordship, content yourself, all shall be avoided, your men and all. Nay, but my soldiers, replied Sir Henry, shall watch all night. Lord Tame answered, there is no need. Well, said he, need or need not, they shall so do. The next day her grace took her journey from thence to Woodstock, where she was enclosed, as before in the Tower of London, the soldiers keeping guard within and without the walls, every day, to the number of sixty, and in the night, without the walls were forty during all the time of her imprisonment. At length she was permitted to walk in the gardens, but under the most severe restrictions, Sir Henry keeping the keys himself, and placing her always under many bolts and locks, when she was induced to call in her jailer, at which he felt offended, and begged her to substitute the word officer. After much earnest entreaty to the council, she obtained permission to write to the queen, but the jailer who brought her pen, ink, and paper stood by her while she wrote, and, when she left off, he carried the things away until they were wanted again. He also insisted upon carrying it himself to the queen, but Elizabeth would not suffer him to be the bearer, and it was presented by one of her gentlemen. After the letter, Doctors Owen and Wendy went to the princess, as the state of her health rendered medical assistance necessary. They stayed with her five or six days, in which time she grew much better, they then returned to the queen, and spoke flatteringly of the princess submission and humility, at which the queen seemed moved, but the bishops wanted a concession that she had offended her majesty. Elizabeth spurned this indirect mode of acknowledging herself guilty. If I have offended, said she, and am guilty, I crave no mercy but the law which I am certain I should have had ere this, if anything could have been proved against me. I wish I were as clear from the peril of my enemies, then should I not be thus bolted and locked up within walls and doors. Much question arose at this time respecting the propriety of uniting the princess to some foreigner, that she might quit the realm with a suitable portion. One of the council had the brutality to urge the necessity of beheading her, if the king, Philip, meant to keep the realm in peace, but the Spaniards, detesting such a base thought, replied, God forbid that Oyer king and master should consent to such an infamous proceeding. Stimulated by a noble principle, the Spaniards from this time repeatedly urged to the king that it would do him the highest honor to liberate the Lady Elizabeth, nor was the king impervious to their solicitation. He took her out of prison, and shortly after she was sent for to Hampton Court. It may be remarked in this place that the fallacy of human reasoning is shown in every moment. The barbarian who suggested the policy of beheading Elizabeth little contemplated the change of condition which his speech would bring about. In her journey from Woodstock, Benefield treated her with the same severity as before, removing her on a stormy day, and not suffering her old servant, who had come to Colnbrook, where she slept, to speak to her. She remained a fortnight strictly guarded and watched, before anyone dared to speak with her, at length the vile gardener with three more of the council, came with great submission. Elizabeth saluted them, remarked that she had been for a long time kept in solitary confinement, and begged they would intercede with the king and queen to deliver her from prison. Gardiner's visit was to draw from the princess a confession of her guilt, but she was guarded against his subtlety, adding, that, rather than admit she had done wrong, she would lie in prison all the rest of her life. The next day Gardiner came again, and kneeling down, declared that the queen was astonished she would persist in affirming that she was blameless whence it would be inferred that the queen had unjustly imprisoned her grace. Gardiner further informed her that the queen had declared that she must tell another tale, before she could be set at liberty. Then, replied the high-minded Elizabeth, I had rather be in prison with honesty and truth, than have my liberty, and be suspected by her majesty. What I have said, I will stand to, nor will I ever speak falsehood. The bishop and his friends then departed, leaving her locked up as before. Seven days after the queen sent for Elizabeth at ten o'clock at night, two years had elapsed since they had seen each other. It created terror in the mind of the princess, who, at setting out, desired her gentlemen and ladies to pray for her, as her return to them again was uncertain. Being conducted to the queen's bedchamber, upon entering it the princess knelt down, and having begged of God to preserve her majesty, she humbly assured her that her majesty had not a more loyal subject in the realm, whatever reports might be circulated to the contrary. 
With a haughty ungraciousness, the imperious queen replied, You will not confess your offense, but stand stoutly to your truth. I pray God it may so fall out. If it do not, said Elizabeth, I request neither favor nor pardon at your majesty's hands. Well, said the queen, you stiffly still persevere in your truth. Besides, you will not confess that you have not been wrongfully punished. I must not say so, if it please your majesty, to you. Why, then, said the queen, the like you will to others. No, if it please your majesty, I have borne the burden, and must bear it. I humbly beseech your majesty to have a good opinion of me and to think me to be your subject, not only from the beginning hitherto, but forever, as long as life lasteth. They departed without any heartfelt satisfaction on either side, nor can we think the conduct of Elizabeth displayed that independence and fortitude which accompanies perfect innocence. Elizabeth submitting that she would not say, neither to the queen nor to others, that she had been unjustly punished, was in direct contradiction to what she had told Gardiner and must have arisen from some motive at this time inexplicable. King Philip is supposed to have been secretly concealed during the interview, and to have been friendly to the princess. In seven days from the time of her return to imprisonment, her severe jailer and his men were discharged, and she was set at liberty, under the constraint of being always attended and watched by some of the Queen's council. For if her gentlemen were sent to the tower without any other charge against them than being zealous servants of their mistress. This event was soon after followed by the happy news of Gardiner's death, for which all good and merciful men glorified God, inasmuch as it had taken the chief tiger from the den, and rendered the life of the Protestant successor of Mary more secure. This miscreant, while the princess was in the tower, sent a secret writ, signed by a few of the council, for her private execution, and, had Mr. Bridges, lieutenant of the tower, been as little scrupulous of dark assassination as this pious prelate was, she must have perished. The warrant not having the Queen's signature, Mr. Bridges hastened to Her Majesty to give her information of it, and to know her mind. This was a plot of Winchester's, who, to convict her of treasonable practices, caused several prisoners to be racked, particularly Mr. Edmund Tremaine and Smithwick were offered considerable bribes to accuse the guiltless princess. Her life was several times in danger. While at Woodstock, fire was apparently put between the boards and ceiling under which she lay. It was also reported strongly that one Paul Penny, the keeper of Woodstock, a notorious ruffian, was appointed to assassinate her, but, however this might be, God counteracted in this point the nefarious designs of the enemies of the Reformation. James Bassett was another appointed to perform the same deed, he was a peculiar favorite of Gardiner, and had come within a mile of Woodstock, intending to speak with Benefield on the subject. The goodness of God however so ordered it that while Bassett was travelling to Woodstock, Benefield, by an order of counsel, was going to London, in consequence of which, he left a positive order with his brother, that no man should be admitted to the princess during his absence, not even with a note from the queen, his brother met the murderer, but the latter's intention was frustrated, as no admission could be obtained. When Elizabeth quitted Woodstock, she left the following lines written with her diamond on the window. Much suspected by me. Nothing proved can be. Quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. With the life of Winchester ceased the extreme danger of the princess, as many of her other secret enemies soon after followed him, and, last of all, her cruel sister, who outlived Gardiner but three years. The death of Mary was ascribed to several causes. The council endeavored to console her in her last moments, imagining it was the absence of her husband that lay heavy at her heart, but though his treatment had some weight, the loss of Calais, the last fortress possessed by the English in France, was the true source of her sorrow. Open my heart, said Mary, when I am dead, and you shall find Calais written there. Religion caused her no alarm, the priests had lulled to rest every misgiving of conscience, which might have obtruded, on account of the accusing spirits of the murdered martyrs. Not the blood she had spilled, but the loss of a town excited her emotions in dying, and this last stroke seemed to be awarded that her fanatical persecution might be paralleled by her political imbecility. We earnestly pray that the annals of no country, Catholic or pagan, may ever be stained with such a repetition of human sacrifices to papal power, and that the detestation in which the character of Mary is holden may be a beacon to succeeding monarchs to avoid the rocks of fanaticism. God's punishment upon some of the persecutors of his people in Mary's reign.
After that arch persecutor, Gardiner, was dead, others followed, of whom Dr. Morgan, Bishop of St. David's, who succeeded Bishop Farrar, is to be noticed. Not long after he was installed in his bishopric, he was stricken by the visitation of God, his food passed through the throat, but rose again with great violence. In this manner, almost literally starved to death, he terminated his existence. Bishop Thornton, suffragan of Dover, was an indefatigable persecutor of the true church. One day after he had exercised his cruel tyranny upon a number of pious persons at Canterbury, he came from the chapter house to Bourne, where as he stood on a Sunday looking at his men playing at bulls, he fell down in a fit of the palsy, and did not long survive. After the latter, succeeded another bishop or suffragan, ordained by Gardiner, who not long after he had been raised to the see of Dover, fell down a pair of stairs in the cardinal's chamber at Greenwich, and broke his neck. He had just received the cardinal's blessing he could receive nothing worse. John Cooper, of Watsam, Suffolk, suffered by perjury, he was from private peak persecuted by one Fenning, who suborned two others to swear that they heard Cooper say, if God did not take away Queen Mary, the devil would. Cooper denied all such words, but Cooper was a Protestant and a heretic, and therefore he was hung, drawn, and quartered, his property confiscated, and his wife and nine children reduced to beggary. The following harvest, however, Grimwood of Hitcham, one of the witnesses before mentioned, was visited for his villainy, while at work, stacking up corn, his bowels suddenly burst out, and before relief could be obtained, her died. Thus was deliberate perjury rewarded by sudden death. In the case of the martyr Mr. Bradford, the severity of Mr. Sheriff Woodroffe has been noticed he rejoiced at the death of the saints, and at Mr. Rogers' execution, he broke the carman's head, because he stopped the cart to let the martyr's children take a last farewell of him. Scarcely had Mr. Woodroffe's sheriffalty expired a week, when he was struck with a paralytic affection, and languished a few days in the most pitiable and helpless condition, presenting a striking contrast to his former activity in the cause of blood. Ralph Larden, who betrayed the martyr George Eagles, is believed to have been afterward arraigned and hanged in consequence of accusing himself. At the bar, he denounced himself in these words, This has most justly fallen upon me, for betraying the innocent blood of that just and good man George Eagles, who was here condemned in the time of Queen Mary by my procurement, when I sold his blood for a little money. As James Abbeys was going to execution, and exhorting the pitying bystanders to adhere steadfastly to the truth, and like him to seal the cause of Christ with their blood, a servant of the sheriffs interrupted him, and blasphemously called his religion heresy, and the good man a lunatic. Scarcely however had the flames reached the martyr, before the fearful stroke of God fell UPN the hardened wretch, in the presence of him he had so cruelly ridiculed. The man was suddenly seized with lunacy, cast off his clothes and shoes before the people, as Abbeys had done just before, to distribute among some poor persons, at the same time exclaiming, Thus did James Abbeys, the true servant of God, who is saved by I am damned. Repeating this often, the sheriff had him secured, and made him put his clothes on, but no sooner was he alone, than he tore them off, and exclaimed as before. Being tied in a cart, he was conveyed to his master's house, and in about half a year he died, just before which a priest came to attend him, with the crucifix, etc., but the wretched man bade him take away such trumpery, and said that he and other priests had been the cause of his damnation, but that Abbeys was saved. One clerk, an avowed enemy of the Protestants in King Edward's reign, hung himself in the Tower of London. Froling, a priest of much celebrity, fell down in the street and died on the spot. Dale, an indefatigable informer, was consumed by vermin and died a miserable spectacle. Alexander, the severe keeper of Newgate, died miserably, swelling to a prodigious size, and became so inwardly putrid that none could come near him. This cruel minister of the law would go to Bonner, Story, and others, requesting them to rid his prison, he was so much pestered with heretics. The son of this keeper, in three years after his father's death, dissipated his great property, and died suddenly in Newgate Market. The sins of the father, says the Decalogue, shall be visited on the children. John Peter, son-in-law of Alexander, a horrid blasphemer and persecutor, died wretchedly. When he affirmed anything, he would say, if it be not true, I pray I may rot ere I die. This awful state visited him in all its loathsomeness. Sir Ralph Ellerker was eagerly desirous to see the heart taken out of Adam Damlip, who was wrongfully put to death. Shortly after Sir Ralph was slain by the French, who mangled him dreadfully, cut off his limbs, and tore his heart out. When Gardiner heard of the miserable end of Judge Hales, 
he called the profession of the gospel a doctrine of desperation, but he forgot that the judge's despondency arose after he had consented to the papistry. But with more reason may this be said of the Catholic tenets, if we consider the miserable end of Dr. Pendleton, Gardiner, and most of the leading persecutors. Gardiner, upon his deathbed, was reminded by a bishop of Peter denying his master, Ah, said Gardiner, I have denied with Peter, but never repented with Peter. After the accession of Elizabeth, most of the Catholic prelates were imprisoned in the tower or the fleet, Bonner was put into the Marshalsea. Of the revilers of God's word, we detail, among many others, the following occurrence. One William Malden, living at Greenwich in servitude, was instructing himself profitably in reading an English primer one winter's evening. A serving man, named John Powell, sat by and ridiculed all that Malden said, who cautioned him not to make a jest of the word of God. Powell nevertheless continued, until Malden came to certain English prayers, and read aloud, Lord, have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, etc. Suddenly the reviler started, and exclaimed, Lord, have mercy upon us. He was struck with the utmost terror of mind, said the evil spirit could not abide that Christ should have any mercy upon him, and sunk into madness. He was remitted to Bedlam, and became an awful warning that God will not always be insulted with impunity. Henry Smith, a student in the law, had a pious Protestant father, of Camden, in Gloucestershire, by whom he was virtuously educated. While studying law in the Middle Temple, he was induced to profess Catholicism, and, going to Louvain, in France, he returned with pardons, crucifixes, and a great freight of popish toys. Not content with these things, he openly reviled the gospel religion he had been brought up in, but conscience one night reproached him so dreadfully, that in a fit of despair he hung himself in his garters. He was buried in a lane, without the Christian service being read over him. Dr. Story, whose name has been so often yawned in the preceding pages, was reserved to be cut off by public execution, a practice in which he had taken great delight when in power. He is supposed to have had a hand in most of the conflagrations in Mary's time, and was even ingenious in his invention of new modes of inflicting torture. When Elizabeth came to the throne, he was committed to prison, but unaccountably effected his escape to the continent, to carry fire and sword there among the Protestant brethren. From the Duke of Alva, at Antwerp, he received a special commission to search all ships for contraband goods, and particularly for English heretical books. Dr. Story gloried in a commission that was ordered by Providence to be his ruin, and to preserve the faithful from his sanguinary cruelty. It was contrived that one Parker, a merchant, should sail to Antwerp and information should be given to Dr. Story that he had a quantity of heretical books on board. The latter no sooner heard this, than he hastened to the vessel, sought everywhere above, and then went under the hatches, which were fastened down upon him. A prosperous gale brought the ship to England, and this traitorous, persecuting rebel was committed to prison, where he remained a considerable time, obstinately objecting to recant his anti-Christian spirit, or admit of Queen Elizabeth's supremacy. He alleged, though by birth and education an Englishman, that he was a sworn subject of the King of Spain, in whose service the famous Duke of Alva was. The doctor being condemned, was laid upon a hurdle, and drawn from the tower to Tyburn, where after being suspended about half an hour, he was cut down, stripped, and the executioner displayed the heart of a traitor. Thus ended the existence of this Nimrod of England.